It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Why is this thing not working? Freaking A, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. There's a right way to fly an airplane, and there's a wrong way. They take on the deadliest flights, ride out the wildest weather. I can't see anything, nothing. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. And do whatever it takes to survive. <laughs> but as long as there's money and fuel to burn. Smell that jet A. They'll live to fly another day. Let's roll! About 80 kilometers east of San Francisco. CB Aviation is scoring. A pilot embarks on a risky journey to change his own destiny. No, you don't understand. We're set to depart tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Corey Benson recently walked away from a lucrative car dealership to follow his passion for aviation. I knew there was a big risk, and I knew there was a very good chance that I wasn't going to make the money that I was making in the car business, but I wanted to do something that I loved. Corey's new job, selling and delivering small secondhand planes. In the industry, it's called ferry flying. And only pilots with nerves of steel need apply. They fly anything, anywhere, anytime. From single engine planes, through turboprops, and multi million dollar jets. If it has wings, they'll take it, no matter how far. Well, we're not Kansas anymore, man. Or how dangerous. Bro, that's bad. It's a radical career change, but Corey is committed. I'm the type of guy that when I decide I'm going to do it, I'm going to find a way to make it work. I never look back. I don't want to get back in the car business. I've basically put all of my eggs in this one basket, and I will make it work. And here's the plane that Corey hopes will jumpstart his dream. This Merlin III, a sleek turboprop built in 1980. Corey bought it in California and sold it to a customer in Australia. To pick up his check, he's going to have to fly the plane on a treacherous journey across the Pacific Ocean. The problem is, the Merlin doesn't have the fuel capacity. So Corey's hired a team of aviation mechanics to install an auxiliary fuel system inside the cabin. A retrofit that will turn the plane into a potential flying bomb. So let's go and check the system out. Now we're going to stick in the aircraft. Everything's new and unfamiliar, especially this jury-rigged backup fuel system. So let's say that you want to use the right tank first. What you do then is that you open this valve here, and you open this valve here. OK. The fuel control panel was built with a mix of aircraft, automotive, and plumbing parts. Put this the way it should be, OK? It's going to be this way. And these two aluminum tanks will be installed in the cockpit, each filled with over 300 liters of fuel. Let's disconnect this one here. It really looks kind of rinky dink. And put it on this side. You're starting to make me a little nervous. You're thinking about that there's going to be nine hours we're going to be over water, and we've got to control the fuel tanks on top of that. I want to make sure it works. I want to make sure it works right, and that we completely understand how to work this. So, so what happens if we had something with the airplane go wrong where we lost power, where it wasn't powering either of the inverters? Let's say you lose these two here. You lose everything on the aircraft and pressurization. You, you don't want that. You're in trouble. That's one of the scariest part about being a ferry pilot, is you're in an unfamiliar airplane going somewhere very dangerous. Most of the people survive. You know, some of them die, of course, but most of them survive. This will be a steep learning curve for Corey. And it just got even steeper. Because he's landed another job. Perfect. Okay. 
In the aircraft delivery business, you never know when the plane's gonna be ready. Sometimes there's two or three flights that come together at the same time, which has happened here. Corey was hired to move a single engine Cessna 206, but this one is over 35 years old. So he's hired a top-notch team to take on the flight for him. Well, you a good feeling to see if she's ready to go across the water, which we need her yes, to be ready to go across the water, so. Bob Rasky has logged over 23,000 hours in every kind of flying machine, from commercial airliners to fighter jets. I'll let you get up. OK. You're, you're, you're younger and more agile, so. <laughs> His co-pilot, Yasmina Platt, has a fraction of that experience just 600 hours in small planes. That looks good there. But she's hungry for more. Be here and go and fly? Awesome. There's nothing better in the world than to go flying. Yeah, your baby's going to treat us well, right? You're going to treat us good? <laughs> this will be the trip of a lifetime, a flight over 10,000 kilometers long from California to Poland, across the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. And they've never flown together. Clear, bro. This first test flight will be a great way to break the ice. The engine sounds good, though, so far. It's very solid. Anything else, Captain? Nope. We're good to go. <laughs> Got to do that. I'm gonna need to learn this one. <laughs> it's just one of many, one of okay, many. Okay, all right. Whoa. But just minutes into the test flight. Look at that thing. It doesn't respond. The old Cessna is misbehaving. Oh, it's not working? Nope. Uh-oh. The left aileron trim is not responding. Well, we tested them on the ground. They did work then. The aileron trim is a hinged flap on the edge of the wing. It controls the plane's rolling motion. With the left trim stuck, the plane is rolling to the right. They're coming down. OK, so descend. Bob decides to land. But he fights to control the plane. Down. Could just be old. If it can break, it will. Back in the hangar, the mechanic discovers serious evidence of neglect. You know, it could be caused just by the age of the aircraft or just the fact that it's been sitting for so long. We thought we had a safe airplane. It will take some detective work to figure out why the aileron trim got stuck and whether this is an isolated incident or a sign of even bigger problems. Either way, this old lady is grounded. You want me to keep running it? Yeah. From the safety angle, this delay is unavoidable. But for Corey's new business, it's a killer. Every day we delay it, it costs us money with pilot fees and hotels and everything else. And so from a business standpoint, I'm always pushing the pilot. With the Cessna in the hangar, Corey is pushing hard to make sure his mechanics keep his first delivery job on schedule. The Merlin 3 turboprop. They don't weigh anything. Be careful when you walk out. The auxiliary fuel tanks are ready to be installed. Just hang on. <sighs> Flying this tricked out aircraft is going to take a special kind of pilot. Someone who won't get spooked by a couple of fuel tanks sitting where the passengers are supposed to be. And someone with enough experience to help Corey on the tricky Pacific crossing. Let's get out of here. It's a job for Captain Randy McGee. All right, let's get out of here. Okay. He'll be Corey's partner on this flight. This flight will be the first time Corey and I have ever flown together. Yeah, it's not normal to take such a big, difficult flight together as your first flight. Normally, you ease into it with a more routine little flight, but we're kind of going for it on this. 
Now that Corey's got a real pro on board, the full magnitude of this challenge is kicking in. At this weight and at these speeds, the airplane's gonna be very hard to control. So we don't control the plane, we've got no chance at all. Most of the added weight is fuel. And now the tricky part, not to spill. Smell that jet A. And with two extra fuel tanks as front row passengers, this plane delivery is definitely not business as usual. Now this is the first time I've ever fueled an airplane from the inside. But just when they're finally ready to go, a heavy fog rolls in. This is really low. We can't take off like this. Not with the weight that we're at. Not with what we're trying to do today. I don't want to be stuck here. We need to get this airplane down there. We can almost see the control tower now. It's You've got different control tower. The control tower is right there. All I see is a bunch of milky white fog. You can't even see the taxiway or the runway. Corey and Randy haven't even left the ground yet. And already, they're in a standoff. We're overweight. We're not going to have great climb performance. We've got mountains out here. I mean, if things go really bad, we could end up dead. We're going to go when it's clear, and that's when we're going to go. All right, and that's, that's, that's the end of it. All right. We're not going to do any more of these flights. If it takes us months to get the airplanes to our clients, they're not going to want to buy anything from us. And then we'll end up going bankrupt. We need to get going now. Corey needed an experienced pilot for this job. And Randy McGee fit the bill. So we need 3,800 pounds a side to fill it up. But Corey's the boss. And that can mean competing agendas. When it's outside of the airplane, then Corey's the boss, and he's making the decisions. I follow his lead, but when it comes to inside the cockpit, I'm the boss, and I'm calling the shots, and we're going to do what I say we're going to do. Clear. Departure's clear. Clear. Randy didn't like the look of the weather and delayed the flight's departure. But now that the fog is cleared, they're all set to go. It's hot out here. We don't have as much wind as in our faces yesterday, but we're going to take off. In the event of an engine failure, we got a nice long runway here. So once I have the airplane under control, you can call the tower and let them know. Otherwise, we'll return here for a visual land. Careful right. takeoff. Just going to use all the runway we can. Normally, they'd be in the air by now. But they're halfway down the runway, and the plane isn't lifting off. 100. One fifteen, one twenty. The heavy turboprop sucks up 1,200 meters of runway, a lot more than it should. One thirty is just a pig, you know. Well, that's not fair. We're just always so overhead. Yeah, we're, we're 15,000 pounds right now. They should be climbing four times faster. The winds down here are actually less. Our fuel flow is higher because we're so much lower than we thought, but we don't have the performance to climb up there. At this lower altitude, the denser air puts more drag on the plane, which burns more fuel. They'll need to climb up to where the air is thinner and keep an eye on the fuel gauges if they want to make it all the way to Australia. Back in California, Corey's second delivery is running behind schedule. The aging Cessna still needs a little TLC before she can take off on the transatlantic trip to Poland. OK, we're going to where Bob is staying and co-pilot Yasmina Platt takes advantage of the downtime to prepare for the dangerous journey ahead. I just want to see the survival equipment that he has. I'm a little worried about the weight and balance on the plane. The flying time from California to Poland is about 70 hours, going across the continental US and above the icy waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. 
Oh my God. You're kidding me. We're taking all this? There's more. I just don't want to scare There's you. There's more? Absolutely, absolutely. Bob so Rasky flies commercial airliners. But for 25 years, he was a US Air Force instructor pilot, an F-16 flight lead, and a combat search and rescue pilot. Sure, OK, so like. He believes in coming prepared. See what we got here. I want to see like if we can prioritize some of this. Okay, I understand some of the stuff is required, right? Like the rafts and stuff, which we don't even ha have here. Which that's going to take up a lot of weight yeah. and space too. Because if it was single engine over the Atlantic, there were no options, you know. I think he is a little bit obsessed, but that's what he's trained for, and he got military training, which I didn't, you know. And he's probably been in situations where he might have gotten scared. We have to take the required items. Sure. And that's actually, a lot of these things are required items. Even yeah. a US flag? Yes, even the US flag, because this can give you motivation out there, give yourself a sense of, I'm going to live, Leave it. I'm going to make it, you know? <laughs> Her concern is the airplane gets there on time, meeting a delivery schedule, and that's a very valid concern. My concern is the plane just gets there, period. In the North Atlantic, you know, with 10 to 20 foot seas, I mean, it's going to be not easy to get that plane stopped straight ahead and just get out. I'm envisioning something hit and we may even go upside down. Right. And that's the training we've gone through. It's yeah. really kind of scaring me. For Yasmina, the idea of a crash landing in the North Atlantic has just become chillingly real. Once Bob started talking about, you know, we really need to take this and, you know, we're going to use this here, it just kind of started making me really, really very nervous, to be honest with you. The next morning, Yasmina gives the plane a thorough safety check. It's very serious. We're losing fuel. Um, and, you know, that's just on the ground. But if we did go up in the air, who knows if we would be losing even more fuel. A few hours ago, she thought Bob was being overly cautious. But the fuel leak has proved him right. You see how it's leaking, right, like through the fuselage? Uh-huh, yeah. That one's really weird. And then it goes all the way back. And then it's dripping down here. So really, we have two. Yeah, just... oh, how frustrating. The airplane mechanic takes a look and doesn't like what he sees. You could have caught fire when you're flying the engine running. I mean, your exhaust is right here, right next to where it's leaking. Yeah, fire is the second, oh, the second thing I'm mostly scared of. The combination of fire and um, ocean would not be good. Yeah. Although, <laughs> I think I would still put it down. Because I think I would still rather go down in the ocean than be burned. Fixing this new problem means more delays. That's OK with Bob, because with his kind of experience, he's got nothing to prove. You know, fuel, hot, metal, not a good combo. So we don't play around with that. The plane's not going to move until it's Fixed. I'm not under the clock. I don't have any pressure. We want to get plane, us, there safely. Number one goal. Almost 2,000 kilometers away off the coast of California, Corey and Randy are fast approaching the halfway point on the first leg of their journey. So it's time to make a critical decision. Our fuel burn is higher by five to 600 pounds, which is half our reserves. One more strike and we're pretty much out of the game. We're really gonna have to uh, consider turning around. Ferry pilots call it the point of no return. When there's enough fuel left in the tanks to turn around, but if they go any further, there's no coming back. This is literally the point. We gotta get it right for real. They've burned more fuel than they expected, and the auxiliary fuel tanks don't have gauges. So Corey estimates the amount of fuel they have left by checking the tanks manually. We're burning more fuel than we expected to burn. We're 8,000 feet less than we thought. Randy goes through another set of calculations before making his decision. Yeah, that's 70 more gallons an hour, and we're looking at almost eight hours. So that leaves us with 300 in the tank. But uh, the winds are going to die down, and we're going to do better on this. We're going to make it up. We're good. We're going. We're going. Randy's taking a calculated risk. 
but that's what this business is all about. And this time, it pays off. Today, at least, it looks like the sharks won't be chowing down on ferry pilots for lunch. We're gonna make it, man. Nice job, El Capitan. And now, they're dropping into their first pit stop. Hawaii, here we come. And yeah, so we're gonna land with a little over an hour of fuel. Just a few hours ago, Corey wasn't so sure they were gonna make it. Now, he's happy that he put Randy in the driver's seat. Gear coming down. Got the runway in sight. Slap set. Hydraulic pressures in the green. Prop sink is off. Nicely done. It's a nice landing though, Randy. Holy crap, we made it! <laughs> In Hawaii, they get the traditional greeting. But Corey and Randy are on the lookout for the gas man. I don't care if we got fuel spilling out. We don't care if you spill a little bit. We're going to measure. We want to get a precise amount of how much fuel he's putting in both tanks so we can um, then subtract how much fuel we burned over the first leg so we know exactly how much fuel we burned. They made the first leg from California to Hawaii with just one hour of fuel left in the tanks. Next stop, Pago Pago in American Samoa. And this time, they want to be dead sure they won't run out of fuel before they get there. Yeah, let, let's get out of here because I can tell the way the air feels, it's really hot and humid. So as the day progresses, that air is going to heat up and those thunderstorms are building. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here. Back in California, mechanics have sunk more than 10 hours into the Cessna. Now they think the old plane is good to go. Hopefully that's the last thing that's going to break on this plane. Yeah, I never want to see this one again. I'm just trying to get the airplane ready, and so now it's time to go. <laughs> that is beautiful. And if the weather holds up, Bob and Yasmina can finally take off and start clocking some serious flight time. Heck, you know, crossing the Atlantic is much more exciting. And a small airplane is going to give me a, a whole different perspective of aviation. And along the way, I'll be thinking, you know, how beautiful the scenery is, but also how um, deadly it could be. And there are few places in the world so vast, unpredictable, and unforgiving as the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, I think it's going to be really big for my career. We're probably going to put about 50 hours on the airplane uh, between the test flights and the flights itself. To this day, when I see some of these airplanes, it's like, wow. We went ahead, uh, went out, did the run up and everything, props fixed, uh, fuel strainer's good to go. So, you guys are ready. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate we'll it. See you. Yeah, we're so excited. It's starting to really become true. <laughs> All right, we're good. Good to go. Good to go. The Cessna lifts off beginning the first leg of a long journey. Destination, Poland, via the east coast of the United States. The engine sounds pretty uh, strong, right? It does, I like it. Yeah, it's gonna be like seven hours, six hours, seven hours of it. Yeah, so there's the Golden Gate. Wow, absolutely beautiful day in San Francisco Bay. Now look, if guys could make it from Alcatraz and swim to the shore and survive, then we could make it in the middle of the North Atlantic if we need to. Right? You want to try it before we go? Like you would. Uh -huh. oh. 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 20 minutes out, the old Cessna runs into a patch of rough air. Whoa. 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 The first sign of trouble ahead. Whoa. Any rougher, these winds could do some serious damage. Okay, hey, your seatbelt uh, on? Good? Yep. Okay. Oh. Bob decides to climb higher, hoping to escape the danger above the clouds. Hang on. 
Okay, going up to 1-1000, one, one right? Yes. Oh, hold on. Oh. Oh. This plane just can't climb, you know? I think after we top this one, we'll get a little better ride. Overweight and loaded down with fuel, the Cessna struggles to reach clear skies. Come on, baby. Bring us up there. This nice old machine. Hang in there. Cool. There we go. In the clear, Yay. in the clear. At this altitude, the aircraft is out of the danger zone. The ball is clear ahead now. Woo! Uh, I like it. 6,000 miles to go, OK? Yay! <laughs> but all it takes is one short moment for everything to change. Oh, what's that, man? OK, I got the up Oh, my here. God. As soon as they reach their cruising altitude, a heavy stream of fuel starts flowing out of the right wing. Hey, uh, Santa, this is uh, 2192. Yeah, we're going to need to divert to Santa Barbara, the nearest airport right now. Is this an emergency? Yeah, we have, uh, looks like a leaking fuel tank, a leaking fuel tank. 112, come back. One able forward, your soul's on board. Two, soul's on board. 112, come back right to that. Eddie's going to take you to the south end for the airport. Uh, it's still running. I wish there was a way that we could stop it from coming in. The closest airport is in Santa Barbara, 10 minutes away. Yeah, I'm just concerned about electrical fire. Absolutely. That would just not be good at all. Fire in the air, a pilot's worst fear. And with fuel pouring out of the Cessna's tank, all it'll take is one spark to turn the cabin into a fireball. Really, like, pretty bad. Okay, so it is leaking pretty good back there. Yeah. Okay. Bob and Yasmina have to get their wheels on the ground before they're blown out of the sky. Okay, okay. I got us going towards Santa Barbara right now. All right, and I have Santa Barbara on the GPS as well, okay. so we can just, you know, use that. Okay, okay. You got the airplane, right? Out of the airplane, we're heading towards Santa Barbara. They're aiming for an emergency landing. No, since you are leaking fuel, we are going to roll the equipment for you. Okay, keep bringing me in. Wow, it's coming to the door. Okay, so what's the distance to Santa Barbara right now? 20 miles. Two, three, zero. Will you be able to make the descent from your present position? We can. On the ground, emergency response units rush to the airstrip, preparing for the worst. They're on the ground, but still not out of danger. Bob unscrews the fuel cap to release pressure and explosive fumes from the tank. As the emergency crew takes over, Yasmina finally allows herself to think about how close they came to total disaster. This could have been really bad. We could have had an electrical fire in any, you know, in a second. And imagine on top of that, it would have happened over the water. Now we're really screwed. Now we have an engine on fire, and the only place we can go is the water. That's all that you're thinking, really. Halfway across the Pacific Ocean, just south of the equator, Corey and Randy are flying straight into a dangerous roller coaster ride with a very scary name, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. This is really dangerous. Turbulence down here is extreme. There are like little bombs going off everywhere. It's like a deadly beltway that circles the globe where warm sea temperatures lower the surface air pressure and create a massive, violent mixture of wind surges, clouds, and rainfall. So we're either gonna have to punch through or we're gonna have to convert a couple hundred miles and I don't think we got the fuel for that. Holy crap. Feel that? Well, we got, we get severe turbulence, especially with how heavy we are, the wind can be damaged. I'm gonna slow it down here, okay? Randy cuts back on the throttle and reduces their speed. But the wind resistance will cost them fuel. In case we run into any really bad bumps, we won't break our airplane. 
They've traveled more than 6,000 kilometers since leaving Hawaii. And after a quick refuel in American Samoa, they're nearing their next pit stop in New Caledonia. So Corey tries to contact the small island's airport. Damn it. Why is this thing not working? But the signal goes dead. There's no one out there. Freaking hey, man. His last option is the satellite phone. You're not gonna believe this. The runway's closed. Our runway at New Caledonia is closed? Are you messing with me? No, I'm not. She said that the that the runway's closed and it's not gonna be open until at least 0530. You're serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. All right, I can't believe this. It's starting to look like Corey and Randy are flying on borrowed time. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean, back in California, the tired old Cessna with a leaky fuel tank is going in for yet another checkup. You can bring it over this way a little more. The leak forced Bob and Yasmina to make an emergency landing but it could just as easily have blown them out of the sky. You see right where the nipple goes into it? See at the base? Right at the... the plane's two main fuel tanks are made of thick rubber and mounted inside each wing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, no, the, the whole nipple is cracked off. You can really see it now here. Um, it's supposed to be behind the strut, which would be a negative pressure oh. area. Oh, that, that probably means the bladder is deteriorated inside, too, as well. The tank probably hadn't been kept full, so the tank is made out of rubber and it dries out. An old mothballed airplane coming out of storage can become a lethal booby trap for even the best of pilots. If it had happened over the Atlantic Ocean, it would have been ugly, because there's no place to land there. Our first impression of her, let's put it that way, is not very good. She just needs to treat us a little better. At this point, um, we're kind of low, you know, on energy and on confidence. Across the Pacific Ocean, above New Caledonia, pilots Randy McGeehy and Corey Benson are circling above a small airport. There's our island right there, huh? Runway is close. They have no choice but to stay in the air and keep burning precious fuel. Close the runway in the middle of the ocean where we have no other options for maintenance. It didn't tell us until now. I don't want to sit out here and hold for an hour and find out that they're not going to open it. Randy and Corey have no idea why the landing strip is closed. If there's a problem with the runway, ground control is not saying. Really puts a lot of stress on us. I mean, with this runway down, we have to divert. All of a sudden, fuel, where we're sitting nice and fat with it, all of a sudden, it becomes a major issue. So Randy radios in a request. Uh, we'd like to descend for a uh, landing, uh, 300 Alpha Lima. So uh, what, what are your intentions? Uh, we'd like to descend for a uh, landing, uh, 300 Alpha Lima. Uh, now runway uh, is open. Call me back uh, on the right hand downwind, 1 1. Only moments after denying permission to land, the New Caledonia flight tower opens the runway. Crisis averted. Thanks for putting me in the middle of nowhere, buddy. An ocean away on the west coast of the United States. That's what it should look like. That's what it should look like. Mike the mechanic is showing off a brand new fuel bladder to Bob and Yasmina. That would be uh, what I would call an accident waiting to happen. It's lucky that you had 150 gallons on board. <laughs> the new fuel tank can be installed in less than a day. But now the pilots are wondering if the old plane is hiding any more dangerous secrets. You know, once we start going over the ocean, we can't have these issues. If we had that going on yesterday, we would have been on the water. You know, from our perspective there, I'm starting to feel a little bit uh, like on a train that's uh, losing parts along the way. So the bottom line is uh, if we don't like the, the direction the airplane goes here in the next day or so, then we say no, period. 
Bob gets in touch with the boss. Hey, we're down here at Santa Barbara, and... Um... He's hoping he can convince Corey to pay for another complete inspection. You know, this is hitting the third strike here, so we're not moving further till it's totally, totally uh, exonerated and checked. Now, I'm glad you guys are okay, and I'm glad you guys got the plane on the ground safely, but we need to get it back in the air. The company needs it in Poland as soon as possible. Personally, I'm not comfortable moving forward with this airplane until it's uh, thoroughly checked by an independent source again. We're hired to move the airplane. We're not hired to do additional inspections. This aircraft has already had two previous inspections and deem it safe. So I don't know why we're doing additional inspections and wasting more time when we've got the skydive company in Poland super frustrated wanting their plane right now. Corey's time is Corey's money. And he knows that if a good mechanic looks hard enough, he can always find something to fix. We're surrounded by this concept of go, go, go. Time is something I can control just by saying yes or no. And by saying no, it gives me the time to make sure that everything's right. And it's about being right. But Corey's not all business. He's also a pilot. So he finally chooses to listen to his better instinct and agrees to the additional round of inspections. Because this is our last good check, you know? And you guys have been all over it, so. Yep, no problem. And if it costs Corey. Good. At least it keeps Bob happy. I was a mechanic in the uh, the military, and they're going to feel that pressure for me all the way until we go, because we are not departing unless I feel happy that the airplane's good to go and ready. Over 10,000 kilometers away, Corey can now shift his attention back to his own delivery. Yeah, it was a little stressful in many parts of the flight, but be ready for a cocktail tonight. The corporate turboprop is now only 1,000 kilometers from its final destination, Sydney, Australia. This is it, man. Going into Sydney here. I'm a little tired right now, but uh, I can't wait to do it again. Holy crap. That's not good. That light means we have 10 minutes left of fuel. Holy The warning light indicates that the transfer fuel pump is malfunctioning and their auxiliary fuel is not getting to the left engine. I don't want to be freaking swimming in the ocean, dude. They have 10 minutes of fuel left in that engine. When it runs dry, the engine will fail. Respecting the left side, that's going to be this switch. The fuel shutoff switch, we're going to close. Hydraulic shutoff switch, close. With one engine down, the plane will lose altitude, and Randy will have to ditch in a controlled crash landing on the water. Right now, at any time if it's gonna go, it's been 10 minutes. Okay, uh, fuel pressure steady. Fuel flow steady. All indications are normal right now. Feel that? The low vibration reverberates through the plane. It sounds like they just lost the left engine. Oh, maybe we're still showing how fuel that's something. That thing scared the crap out of me. Come on, baby. The minutes pass. The engines continue to fire. The problem seems to be a faulty warning light. Thank God. It's the longest 10 minutes of my life. Yeah. Let's, I think we're out of the danger zone, so let's just uh, keep going ahead here, OK? OK. Awesome. Back in the United States, a leaky fuel tank has been replaced. And now Bob and Yasmina think they might be able to coax the old plane into taking off and heading out for the long haul across the ocean. So Mike and Kim, would you take this airplane to Poland now when it leaves the hangar? Sure. The two pilots have been trying to put California in their rearview mirror for over a week now. 
it's good to catch all these things before we go because my confidence goes better now. And I'll tell you, once we make it to Midland with no issues, then I'll feel even better. Well, we still got, we still got 3,000 miles to go. It's a long now, leg. Another issue than this next leg, that, um, that's probably it for me. But it looks like today might be the day. The mechanics have signed off on the plane, and the pilots are ready to take the aging Cessna across the continental US with two pit stops, one in Texas and the other in Tennessee. By nightfall, they should be in Rhode Island. I'm just to the point that it's like, I value my life more than one trip, so. We'll see what happens, but hopefully, you know, we don't have any more issues with it. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean. We're over land, holy <laughs> Corey and Randy have made it to the finish line of their 12,500 kilometer journey to Sydney, Australia. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> The Merlin 3 corporate turboprop will be Corey's first international delivery. Nicely <laughs> done. Woohoo! Corey knows he couldn't have done it without Randy. People can say whatever they want about it. I mean, you and I did it. We brought this thing across an ocean. Fuel problems, airplane problems, weather problems, with just little, little teeny, teeny postage stamps of land in between. A plane that's not made to do that. And we did it, you know? What a trip. I feel great. I got goosebumps right now. It's a fun trip, great trip. Good to be here. It was an adventure of a lifetime. Minutes after touchdown, Corey gets ready to meet a happy customer. And for the first time since he took off, he's starting to feel confident that his new business is going to fly. He's very excited to see this airplane. I can't wait to see his face. He's going to be very happy with it. Um, this airplane, all in all, is a very nice aircraft. Wow. I think it exceeds all of his expectations. Thanks so much. It's going to sit on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. You hope well, it was worth the wait well, there, well you know? You, I thought it was just going to be, you know, sit up there and sit the autopilot and read a magazine and hang out. And that definitely was not the case. This trip is probably one of the most dangerous trips you can do. Back up north. Bob and Yasmina have made it to Rhode Island. We are here. It's nice to good job. touch ground. Very good, very good, very good. Here. Yeah, it was a good play. You did very nice. The, uh, and she, she did as well. So how are you feeling about the play, man? A lot better. But their confidence will be short-lived. I'll show you the filter over here. This is all, it's some steel, but most of it's aluminum. There's too much in here. During post-flight maintenance, mechanics discover the biggest problem yet. Oh my god. I've never seen this much. A so lot, where could it moment. be coming from? Well, the steel could be uh, from the cam followers, you know, uh, a part of the cam. Bob asked the mechanic to perform an oil change, and he discovered metal filings in the engine. OK, because that's where the steel component that's is, right? right. So, so would you would you feel comfortable flying this across the North no. Atlantic right now? Absolutely not. So what do you North recommend? North the engine needs to be taken apart or another or another engine, period. If I was doing an annual on this, this would be un -airworthy, period. Okay. It's oh, un wow. It's un -airworthy. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. You see how it's leaking through the fuselage? Across distances they were never meant to fly. If it had happened over the Atlantic Ocean, it would have been ugly. That's not good. There's a right way to fly an airplane, and there's a wrong way. And as long as there's money and fuel to burn, 
We don't care if you spill a little bit. They will fly anything. To this day, when I see some of these airplanes, it's like, wow. Anywhere. I took that plane where it was never meant to go. Anytime. Holy crap, we made it. <laughs> At a small airport in Rhode Island, pilots Bob Rasky and Yasmina Platt have run into big trouble. An oil change is a normal thing. We were low on oil anyway. They were hired to jockey a 36-year-old single-engine Cessna from California to Poland, a flight over 10,000 kilometers long that will take them across the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. But the job is starting to look like a suicide mission. First, it was the left flap. Whoa. Look at that thing. Oh, it's not working? Nope. Uh-oh. Then, a fuel leak. Oh, my God. Okay, so it is leaking pretty good back there. Yeah, okay. I'm just concerned about electrical fire. We're gonna need to divert the nearest airport right now. Now, metal filings in the oil filter indicate the engine is falling apart. Oh my God. Would you feel comfortable flying this across the North no, Atlantic? Absolutely not. So what do you North recommend? It's unairworthy. For Bob, this is the third and last strike. He refuses to fly this plane again without a thorough maintenance job. It's actually recommended by anybody ferrying across the North Atlantic to do that at least two or three times before you go, including doing soap analysis. That's recommendations. His boss, Corey Benson, disagrees. That's not how it works. We cannot authorize work on someone else's airplane. Let's say they find something. Are you going to pay to fix it? Because the owner could just as easily say, well, you guys authorize the inspection. I'm not paying for it. You pay for it. And I know sure as hell I'm not going to pay for it. Corey's in the business of delivering planes, not fixing them. But with his hired guns ready to bail, he's got no choice but to talk to the mechanic. Yeah, oh, hold on a second. Here you go. The verdict. The engine needs an overhaul. This plane delivery has already been delayed by a week. And in Poland, the client is running out of patience. We are paying for the Cessna, and we have to pay also the rental. Uh, aircraft, so we're paying double. That's why we desperately needed uh, that plane. She'll keep losing money until Corey delivers the plane. But now, his pilots have second thoughts about finishing the job. It's uh, easy enough to acquiesce to the fact that we got it here, we got to a certain point, it might be time to hand it off to somebody else. Heading home. Corey's pilots are throwing in the towel. Bob and I have done everything we can, and we've brought it as far as it would let us. It needs another doctor to look at her. They're calling it quits, and Corey's finding out that running a plane delivery business can be more stressful than flying. I don't know what's going to happen. First thing is it's more delays, period. I mean, it, it, it could be as simple as just a new cylinder they need to put on it. But if it needs a new engine, it's at least two, three weeks. Worse, the grounded Cessna is just half of Corey's nightmare. Now he's got another job to get off the ground and another client who wants the plane delivered yesterday. When the plane's ready, the client expects you to be ready and to leave right then. I cannot tell them that they have to wait another week or two weeks because I'm doing another flight. They want their plane now. And so we have to have other pilots ready to go that are trained in the airplane that can ferry it if I'm busy. Corey thinks he's got the right guy to take on this new job. Carrie McCauley owns a skydiving school in Wisconsin. Over a decade ago, Carrie made his living delivering planes across the globe. And he signed on with Corey to find out if he's still got the nerve to do his old job once again. I've crossed the ocean many times, flown over Africa, Europe, Middle East. If I screw this one up, all the people that uh, know me and have heard all my glorious stories over the years are gonna be uh, snickering behind my back or to my face. That was a blast. <laughs> I needed that. Carrie might be a little rusty, but he's no rookie. 
Some pilots, they call the office and call the boss every 10 minutes. They want every decision made for them. They want help. They want their hand held all the way across. There she is. If I don't bother Corey, if I just get the job done with the minimum amount of interference and with the minimum amount of money, he'll be impressed. Good morning, guys. George Johnson. Hey, George. Kerry McCauley. Kerry. Stu Sprung. Stu, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Stu Sprung will be Kerry's co-pilot. And this morning, he's meeting the plane for the first time. For what the doctor intends it. For me, it'll be definitely uncharted waters. A flying over the Amazon, I'm not quite sure how that's going to make me feel. It's a very low time airplane. It's got about 2,000 hours total time. What year is it? It's uh, 1989. This is a Beechcraft Bonanza. Based on World War II fighter plane technology, the Bonanza has been in production for over half a century. It's a close cousin of the first Bonanza, which killed musicians Buddy Holly and Richie Valens in 1959. You know, it's hard to see problems in some of these planes when they've washed them and waxed them and detailed them like that. Flying a plane for someone else is a lot like a high altitude blind date. The pilots never really know what they're getting into. People have told us this is a great plane, it's in great condition, fresh out of its annual inspection, but I need to see for myself. And sometimes, even the best airplanes have a dirty little secret. You hear that? It sounds like something's rubbing. Yeah, it's loudest right here. Last thing is we need is for one of those rods to wear all the way through and we're halfway over Brazil. They'll need to get this fixed before they can take off. They've got a long flight ahead. Almost 8,000 kilometers from Greensboro, North Carolina to Porto Alegre in Brazil. So you're saying from St. Bart's to Grenada to Georgetown and you want to make Macapa in the same day? That's going to be tough. That would have to be a perfect day. That's uh, about 1,400 miles. And according to the latest forecasts, the only thing perfect about the upcoming weather is a perfect storm. A monster hurricane lurking on the outskirts of Cary and Stu's flight path. We don't need to have the whole conversation about being pessimistic. We're optimistic. We're going to make it. I'm going to do a parallel plan. I'm going to call what it a realistic plan. Stu knows that flight plans almost always change. But what's really bugging him is a problem that he can't fix. It just irritates me to even talk, have to even it's... think about it. I mean, ain't that the way it goes? You know, the one big key commitment you have. Stu is a retired firefighter. Every year since the 9-11 terror attacks, he's joined his fellow firefighters for a memorial. And he took this job on one condition, that he could be in New York City for the 10th anniversary. That was a very devastating time. I worked there with the New York City firefighters. Some of my best friends were New York City firefighters that uh, passed away that day. We made a pledge never to forget. And so if I'm not there because I'm flying an aircraft to Brazil, it'll tear away at me. It's just, I just don't even want to have to deal with that. We're a team. Take care of each other. And your well-being is my well-being. That's true. So let's talk about both our well-beings in this freaking hurricane that's bearing down on us. Um... A hurricane of this size could shatter a small plane in a few seconds. So the only way to survive it is to find a way around it. A better boogie. Nice. Yeah, yeah. If Stu has any chance to make it back to New York in time, they have to get to the first stop before the hurricane. Game plan is just trying to get ahead of it. The irony is if to beat the hurricane, we have to fly right at it. Gear up. And we're off. In Rhode Island, the delivery of a 36-year-old Cessna 206 is in jeopardy. And Corey Benson is here because his pilots walked out. Now the boss has no choice but to finish the job himself. I had to drop everything to get out here and finish the flight. So it's frustrating, but my company's reputation is riding on this flight. I got to get the aircraft there. Hey, Joe. Hi, Corey Benson. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet hey, you. Joe. Randy. Randy McGee. Welcome to Rhode Island. Nice Corey's convinced his friend and expert pilot, Randy McGee, to lend him a hand. This isn't the first time Randy has been a lifesaver. 
He piloted Corey's first delivery, a dangerous flight from California to Australia. Whoa. Slow it down here, okay. In case we run into any bad bumps, we won't break our airplane. Things got a little bumpy over the Pacific. That light means we have 10 minutes left of fuel. I don't want to be freaking swimming in the ocean, dude. They both lived to tell the tale. Holy crap, we made it. <laughs> and now, Randy's back for more. How she look? Oh, she looks pretty good now. I mean, we've changed the engine in it. As far as used engines go, it's, it's about the best you're going to get. I did everything I could, test flying it, running her on the ground. It's all yours now. All right, thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, Joe, appreciate it. The refurbished engine might give the plane a second life or turn this trip into the last fatal flight. All right. The plane definitely had some major issues, and that's a big red warning light walking into this situation. But I can't let that cloud my evaluation of the airplane right now as the airplane sits there. When Corey and Randy leave Rhode Island, they'll begin a deadly game of hopscotch to get to Poland landing on remote airstrips when their fuel runs low over the cold North Atlantic, where even a small storm can turn the little airplane into a cocktail shaker. That's why both pilots signed up for a two-day survival course before the flight. All right, once you sit down, grab your seatbelt. Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, excitement with some nervousness mixed in there. Yeah, for sure. You're gonna hear me say ditching, ditching, ditching. Ditching is the controlled landing of a plane on water. But for the pilots, it's code for life or death. We're gonna lower down underwater and submerge. Great reference point for you to use to find that jettison handle is the reference right off of your knee. It won't do any good to survive the impact if they can't get out of the plane. And if they don't find that jettison handle, they might never get out. If Corey and Randy go down at sea, after impact, icy cold water will fill the cockpit in seconds. It was a very eerie feeling. Your sinuses fill up, you're disoriented, you have no idea where you're at, you can't see anything. You have to use your position points to, to locate your emergency exit and to get out, all while holding your breath. And if you got in there and didn't have a plan, didn't know what you're doing, I don't think you'd make it. I can feel that little bit of fear or panic start to creep in a little bit, and uh, it's not a good feeling at all. While the going is still good, Corey wants to take off. If we wait a few more hours, there'll just be embedded thunderstorms in the clouds. So we've got a window of just a short time to get off the ground to be able to make our destination where we'll be stuck somewhere. Ready, cowboy? I'm ready. Today's flight to Goose Bay, Canada will be overland. From there on, it's do or die. Back down south, over the Caribbean Sea. Carrie and Stu are playing chicken with a monster hurricane over 600 kilometers wide. Just off the right of her nose, that's not good. One hour till hurricane time. Carrie's gambling the Beechcraft Bonanza can outrun the storm and leave disaster in his rearview mirror. Got a couple of lightning strikes on the I had storm scope. Yep. Yeah. And there is a big thunderstorm right in front of us. That one right there, that's huge. Yeah. That one there is huge. I just saw lightning. We might be screwed. If they can beat the storm, Stu has a chance to make it back to New York for the 9-11 memorial of the terror attacks. If this hurricane delays us by a day, then I'm gonna be left with having to make a very difficult decision on whether I can complete the trip or possibly not go to New York. There's some pretty serious airplanes that have been destroyed yeah. in the air. 
just by thunderstorm stuff, not a category two or three hurricane. We gotta be careful too though, because we're losing daylight. Yeah, yeah. If we go off course too far, we're gonna get there after dark. The six cylinder engine powers the Bonanza to a top speed of over 300 kilometers per hour. And they're knocking off some serious mileage. But their flight path is starting to look like a kamikaze mission. The aging Cessna has delivered Randy and Corey safely to their first fuel stop. Now they prepare to go head to head with the unforgiving and potentially deadly North Atlantic. Well, Capitan, here we go. Here we go. Dude, my stomach's turning a little bit. What do you mean by that? You feeling nervous, all right, man? Putting on these survival suits brings home the danger. Reality's setting in. This is a big flight. This is uh, by far the most dangerous flight I've ever done. I just want to stay dry. If the crash doesn't kill them, the cold water will in about 15 minutes. These high-tech survival suits might keep their blood warm and their hearts pumping long enough to get picked up alive by a rescue team. It's going to be hard to zip these up sitting down, you know? In the tiny Cessna, there's no way and no time to put these suits on in an emergency. So they have to fly half zipped in. The suit is like a full dry suit, and plus it has a liner in there to help keep your body warm. And so they're very bulky, they're hard, they're sweaty on the inside um, because it doesn't allow any water to get in at all. I mean, all the way from your toes up to your neck, you're trapped in that suit. She's climbing nicely. This is no dress rehearsal. It's showtime. No more land. We will not see land for many hours. Probably 99.9% .9 of the people in the world that have never taken a single engine piston across the Atlantic. You know that? What's that say about us? We're badass mofos. The first leg goes without a hitch. Just get us there, old Cessna. They dropped in on a Greenland airstrip and refueled. Now they're back up, looking at more than 1,000 kilometers of white-knuckled flying before their next stop, Reykjavik, Iceland. Headwind's picking up. We just lost five knots in the last five minutes. Down to 122 knots ground speed. It's been 20 hours since they left Rhode Island and they'll be rubbing elbows in this cramped cockpit for at least another five hours before the next pit stop. Your speed just keeps declining. On this flight, it seems something is always going wrong, and they're starting to feel like they're riding in a flying coffin. What's our ground speed? 99 knots. Ground speed is the measure of the Cessna's speed relative to the Earth. And right now, a headwind is slowing down the plane forcing the pilots to burn more fuel than they estimated. But well, we can't maintain 95, 96 knots ground speed. We won't make it. No, we're gonna have to have some seriously improving performance, man, or we're gonna make this gonna be a short trip. If the headwinds keep up at the current rate, their tanks could run dry before they reach their destination. So Corey does the math. Okay, Randy, here's basically what I came up with. It took us 45 minutes to get to cruising altitude. We're right at that hour of fuel reserve with everything staying the same. I mean, it's right on that, it's right on that verge. I don't, I mean. Before this trip, Corey's team built an extra fuel tank to extend the Cessna's range. They rigged the homemade 58-gallon tank into the passenger compartment an additional piece of cargo that gives them enough fuel to cross the Atlantic. But it's like riding in a flying bomb. We can only go out this way for about another 20 or 30 minutes, or we're gonna, and we're gonna have to turn around and go back. I got no choice. 
But now, even with the extra tank, the fuel levels are running dangerously low. And Randy's getting worried because they're approaching the point of no return. I think whatever we're going to do, we got to do it now, figure it out now. The point of no return is a go or no go decision for a pilot. You only have the fuel to go forward. So even if you want to turn around, you can't make it. I want you to look in that tank and tell me what you see. Or maybe I should do it, because I know I've been looking back there. I have a better gauge of how much fuel's in there. OK. I'm going to transfer control to you, OK? You have the airplane. I'm going to unbuckle and go mess with this fuel tank. You have the airplane? Got the airplane. The auxiliary fuel tank doesn't have a gauge, so Randy has to eyeball what fuel is left. This is really difficult with these suits on, man. It's a pain in the ass. Oh, what was that? OK. I'm taking off the cap. All of a sudden, that thing just flies up. It was like an explosion, man. I took a huge whiff of fumes, man, and I don't feel too good. Fuel under high pressure just blew out of the tank into the cabin. And now it won't take more than a tiny spark to explode. If I could choose one way not to die, it's I don't want to be burned to death. That thing is awful. And in an airplane, if, if you have a fire, it's something that uh, can kill you very quickly. And there's nothing you can do. Those fumes were nasty. All the electronics we got in here, fuel would burn. The vapors explode. And, uh, geez, we got to be careful, man. We got to keep this thing well ventilated. Randy cracks open a window to clear out the gas fumes. <laughs> Do you need to check your pants, man? Does it... Did you hear me yell? I scream like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> when the fuel tank blew in my face, I was able to, for whatever reason, keep my cool and keep operating that airplane. If you panic, and quit thinking you're dead, period. But it's still a long way to the next pit stop. Back down south in the Caribbean, pilots Kerry McCauley and Stu Sprung are avoiding a fight they were guaranteed to lose by steering the Beechcraft Bonanza around a deadly hurricane. It's gonna add about an hour or so under our trip. Kinda stretch our fuel a bit. But we kind of got to do it now, because that looks pretty nasty. I don't want to wait until we're right in it. Let's uh, run away and live to fly another day. They veer off to avoid the monster winds and violent rains. Boy, I'm really glad we got that hurricane behind us. I mean, that was a real stress builder. It says, uh... St. Martin at 6. Would you say what sunset that was? 7.30. So if we could turn and burn in an hour, be there by 7. No, we'll be there waiting. It's only three hours to St. Martin. Three and a half. The good news is Hurricane Katia won't win this fight by a knockout. The bad news is the detour puts them in St. Martin after dark. And flying blind is never fun. What well, really gets screwy with these islands at night is completely surrounded with blackness and just this little tiny strip of lights. Oh. St. Martin, finally. Hurricane missed you guys, huh? We're always great when they're lucky when they miss us. I kind of wanted to see it. I wanted to get a little closer. But yeah, it's not my airplane, so I... <laughs> I should probably take good care of it. The owner might not appreciate hurricane damage. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a safe landing makes any day a good day. But Stu has other things and places on his mind. Something will jam us up. I guarantee it. For me, when you get as lucky as we have on this trip, it's almost a sign that something's going to come down the chute and, and screw it all up. Every corner I turn, I'm expecting it. Every day, two or three things come up that could cause potential delays. We just don't know what they are until they hit us. Back up north, Corey and Randy are approaching Iceland with 30 minutes of fuel to spare and enough fumes in their jury-rigged tank to blow them halfway to the moon. 
Wow, Corey, you come a long way on your fuel calculation since Australia. Go f yourself. If Randy is unimpressed by his co-pilot's flight skills, he's not saying too much. Because the co-pilot on this flight is also the boss, and he's signing the checks. Let's get out of here, huh? That flight did not disappoint. The wind was terrible. Fuel problem. That just makes it interesting, man. <laughs> That's right. Makes for a good story later, yeah. right? Yeah. As long as you make it. Yeah. As long. <laughs> Small businessmen like Corey don't survive long without learning how to cut a few corners. But there's something about flying a single-engine plane across the ocean that can make even the toughest men think twice. <laughs> this vent is supposed to be attached, and that, that starts to give me a clue to some of the problems we may have been having while we were having the explosion. Something not right with that. We got to get a mechanic to take a look at that. If the tank of extra fuel blew its top because it wasn't venting properly, Randy doesn't want that to happen again. It doesn't look good. This thing this is really f***ed up. And, uh, Something you can fix quickly, you think? Well, no, not quickly. You know, we're, we're really trying to get out of here. Yeah, I believe that. So, Randy and the mechanic both know they'll need at least a day or more to make the fix and to do it right. But for Corey, it's another crippling setback. He's over a month behind on the delivery of this plane. His reputation is on the line. We gotta get the plane to the client, and there's a chance we're gonna be here three or four days. As for Randy, he's willing to do whatever it takes to deliver the plane safely, even if it means pulling rank on his co-pilot and boss. Way down south in the tropics, close to the equator, Carrie and Stu's Beechcraft Bonanza is 24 hours away from reaching their final destination, and their spirits are high. Is this an old ferry trick, ferry pilot trick that you have with the GPS? If we got a ditch in the ocean, I would like to ditch in front of a cruise ship because we'd be in the hot tub with a margarita within the hour. Where do I shut off the gas? <laughs> These pilots only met a few days ago, but the adventure has already turned them into old friends. It doesn't always work out that way. Hey. Two pilots are flying together and their personalities don't click, it's really gonna be a problem. 36 hours shoulder to shoulder with another guy will not be a lot of fun if you don't get along. You have a great sense of humor, shrug off the problems and just keep flying. You'll have a great trip and you'll make a great ferry pilot. Well, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get some gas, file a flight plan, and hopefully make this stop less than an hour. They're halfway through today's flight plan. If things keep going along, they'll reach Brazil by sundown. All right, fueled up, ready to go. Flight plan's filed. Not so fast. Either having issues with the registration for this plane, and they can't get permission for us to land in Brazil so we can't take off. <laughs> On any other flight, a delay like this would be no big deal. But Stu has made it clear from the start. He promised his firefighter brothers he would be in New York for the 9-11 memorial, even if it means abandoning his captain today. Hey, Corey, it's Stu. How you doing? So nothing from even the FAA, right? This should have been done two weeks ago. Why do they wait till we're <laughs> moments from entering Brazil to say, oh, hey, hey, by the way, we literally didn't... about to take off. Why boss Corey didn't get the Brazilian paperwork done is a mystery. But if Stu bails out now, Corey will need a lot more than paperwork. He'll need a new pilot. This is the delay that can't happen. This is not a small leg. It's not a leg that we can make up the next day. This is a whole day right here down the tubes. We did make it through a hurricane. But we can't make it through Brazilian paperwork. <laughs> no pilot lands in a foreign country without permission, unless he's looking for free room and board. Yeah, I don't feel like going to the Brazilian jail. The only thing about that is they'll probably only take one of us to jail. Yeah, but well, they always take the pretty one. <laughs> I'll make sure, I'll, get you, I'll bring you some smokes in prison. Boy, I love you, man. You're always thinking of me, my well-being. I, I know. How, how can you make me comfortable in a Brazilian prison? I'm touched. I'm, I'm so touched <laughs> that you were thinking of me. 
How's it going? All that's left to do is kill time in town and hope for news from the office before it's too late. Oh, Gary, you're gonna love this. What? It's currently Independence Day in Brazil. So I'm having a hard time getting in touch with anybody. No way! <laughs> but Stu doesn't have to say what they both know all too well. Time is running out fast. Corey and Randy have flown more than halfway across the frozen North Atlantic seas. And after being grounded for 48 hours in Iceland for repairs, the two of them are just dying to fly. All right, buddy, it's game time. Let's get pulled up and let's get out of here. Okay. Gotta try and make up some of this time. And Corey's got a lot to make up. It's game day. We need to get this plane down to Poland. We have a job to do. The, the clients are waiting for us. Assuming that the weather is cooperating, we'll be in the air early and we'll, we'll get going. The next leg will stretch the range of the old Cessna 206. Once again, they'll be relying on that homemade fuel tank. And Randy wants to make sure it doesn't explode again. This flight's no joke. We've got about 600 miles of open ocean. We can't let down our guard now, because if this flight's taught you anything, the unexpected is, is going to happen. The next leg is a six-hour journey to Scotland across the unforgiving North Atlantic. It's a lot of time in a single-engine plane with no place to land if anything goes wrong. We should already be there by now. Corey's flying the same plane, but he's being driven by a different kind of engine, the money machine. You gotta move quick, the wind's getting stronger. Let's go, let's do it. To Randy, Corey sounds less and less like a co-pilot and more and more like a nervous businessman. He's gotta realize that flying, there's no mistakes. We got one shot at it. Hey, listen, I'm gonna fly this leg. You haven't been taking this flight seriously enough. I wanna drive that point home with you, okay? So you're not gonna fly this leg, I'm gonna fly it until you start taking it a little more seriously. Whatever you want. Corey might be the boss, but Randy puts his foot down. This is one business where a shortcut can lead to disaster. Got our checklist. Seatbelt, stores, locks. In the tropical heat of Guyana, Carrie and Stu have finally received authorization to land on Brazilian soil. We've gotten the proper paperwork. Uh, CB was able to uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat. They're a full day behind schedule, and Stu's appointment with the New York 9-11 Memorial is coming up fast. All right, let's get the show on the road. Today doesn't go perfect. He's not going to be able to finish the trip and get to New York on time. Gear up. Gear up. Carrie is determined to do whatever it takes to make Stu finish the job. That's why he's decided to fly 2,700 kilometers from Georgetown, Guyana to Goiânia, Brazil, with just one fuel stop. Wow, what is that? Looks like a huge... There's a cliff Huge there. cliff and yeah. some, wow, oh, this is cool. This is the kind of flight that can remind even the most jaded pilot why he fell in love with flying. Look yeah. at this, holy cow. That's huge. The whole thing just looks like it's out of the lost world or something. Look at that. Wow. Unbelievable. Pretty impressive. Oh my God, awesome. You know, this is why I ferry fly. Who else gets a chance to do this? Well, I got a new high point in my life. That was... <laughs> Woo! That was cool. Over a thousand kilometers later, they drop into Macapá for refueling and customs clearance. But there's a problem. I am blind English. It's my Saturday, my customs. Mañana. Mine's over. Customs apparently is 
closed for the day, mm -hmm. so that can't be done. The runway is closed from 8 to noon for they're working on the runway, 8 to noon tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, really? I mean... <sighs> it's the bad news Stu had feared all along. I have to say I'm a little uh, speechless right now. There's no effing way I'm going to be able to make it from here to anywhere else and make it to New York. This is my last stop. I'm done. For Stu, this flight is over. But he still has to break the news to his boss, Corey, who's now flying as co-pilot on the flight to Poland. It's the big blow that we were hoping wouldn't happen. Up north, Corey and Randy reach the green highlands of Scotland. After flying the shaky Cessna over thousands of kilometers of treacherous ocean, the rolling hills below their wings have let them forget about their differences. Well done, Capitan. By the time we landed, I was really excited and like, wow, that was great. By the time we parked that airplane, I had tanked. I was really tired, um, just uh, really almost not even thinking quite straight anymore. They might be exhausted, but Corey isn't wasting any time. He's determined to keep moving. You have to have incredible stamina to do this type of flying. We put in a lot of hours in the cockpit every day. We don't get a ton of sleep, and we're expected to get up and do it the next day. Sometimes, a pilot has nothing left to run on but sheer willpower. It's very physically challenging. Jumping time zones, being at altitude where the air is less, and so that takes a physical toll on you. It knocks you on your ass sometimes. <laughs> that was a good one, dude. Man, I'm like fighting it hard over here. Corey wants to be in Poland before sunset. This is the final destination into uh, Poland. It's a little grass strip that we're going to be delivering the airplane to, so we've got to hurry and turn and burn and, and get it there. So, almost done. One more leg left. That gives him just two hours to get the Cessna ready for takeoff. But Randy has just discovered they might need a little more time. We have a strut problem. Our strut's starting to give us some issues, so need a few minutes to think it over. and. Uh, do a little further investigation on the airplane and, and a little closer look at the weather, and then, uh, then I'll make a decision whether we're going to go or not. The strut connecting to the front landing gear is leaking oil. It's not bad enough to ground the Cessna, but if landing conditions aren't perfect, on touchdown, it could make the plane hard to handle, and Randy isn't going to chance it. At our destination, which I just found out is a grass field, uh, we're supposed to have rain showers and winds gusting 20 knots, gusting to 35 knots. That may keep us here for another day. Randy knows that even without the faulty strut, a soggy runway and a strong crosswind could snap the Cessna's landing gear. Right now, we're not sure the plane's ready. We're not sure the weather's going to be good enough, so. We need to get going, though. I mean, we, have to, we have to get it there tonight. We don't have to do anything. If it gets too late, we'll just have to stay. Corey may be the boss, but Randy's word is law, and he's not backing down. A few hours later, Corey catches a lucky break. Where I think we can go. Really? Yeah, I think it's looking good. Let's get the hell out of here. All right. The weather cleared, so Randy said OK to setting out on the final leg to Poland. Randy, it's going to be interesting when we land here in a couple minutes. I know, man. We don't know what to expect. I mean, she could be really upset with us. She could be really happy. We don't know. Now that they'll be landing soon, their thoughts have turned to their last and potentially biggest problem one hard-nosed, no-nonsense Polish customer. I think she's just extremely frustrated with the situation because this plane was supposed to be here almost a month ago. It 
Corey, we're almost there. Let's do it right. All right, boss. There is a concrete strip right there. The concrete runway should be a lot safer than a dirt strip. Yeah, it's concrete, but it's all broken up. It's pretty cracked. But there's only one way to find out if the leaky strut can absorb the shock of a bumpy landing. And now that the new owner is watching their final approach, they'd better put on a good show. All right, Corey, this is it. Speed's looking good, everything's looking good. I just hope this runway surface is good. Thing the customer is only watching from a distance because it's one rough landing, but the gear holds up. Nice well, done, bro. well done. Hello. Congratulations, we finally got it here for you. Thank There's the keys. You so much. How are you? I'm Corey I'm Benson. Fine. Nice Hello. to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. We brought you a little present. Thank you. As well as the plane that you've been waiting for forever, this huh? This is my present. <laughs> yeah. Her skydiving school has been hemorrhaging money on the rental of another plane. But now that she's got her Cessna, she'll soon be out of the red. And that means Corey finally has a happy customer. We definitely uh, went through a lot for him, and, uh, you know, that's our job, and um, we're happy to do it. Well, it's better late than never. We yeah. got her here safely. <laughs> <laughs> when we finally land, and they're frustrated because it's a few days late, but it's like, wait a minute, we just we just put our lives in our hand. We just crossed the ocean in a single engine piston, and come on. Way down south in the tropics, Hey, Corey, it's Stu. How you doing? Carrie and Stu's yeah, oh, mad yeah, race against yeah, time has come to an abrupt stop. Uh, we just landed in Makapa. Uh, customs was closed early, so we can't do any customs until tomorrow morning at 8. And the runway is closed for maintenance from 8 until noon tomorrow. Stu is on the phone with boss Corey, who's just landed in Poland, and he's giving Corey the bad news. He's bailing out. That basically kills it. So yeah, I'd be committed to leaving from here. So you're you're gonna come all the way down here to take my spot. Stu is going to New York to the 9-11 memorial, and Corey is flying into Macapa to replace him, which means Carrie is temporarily grounded. You're kidding me, you are shit. Am I forbidden to continue on? Can I meet him at the next stop? I mean, for me to sit here with a good airplane and... The way Stu tells it, he held up his part of the bargain, but he's still splitting up the team and leaving a job unfinished. It's tough for me to leave you because I'm worried that us leaving you stranded. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Yeah, it'll probably be easier. I won't have to listen to your boring stories. And... All right. I've done tons of trips like these, and far more dangerous, far more difficult by myself. To have someone come down here to help me for the last uh, third of the trip is really unnecessary and just drives me nuts to have to wait. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Why is this thing not working? Freaking A, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. The most extreme type of flying you can do. Slow uh, down. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. It's not a job for everyone. Heading home. 
but there's always someone daring enough to take it on. Dude, my stomach's turning a little bit. Oh, what was that? And live to fly another day. This has been a delivery from hell. Minimums, minimums. Too low, terrain. This is my last stop, I'm done. Carrie McCauley is where no ferry flyer wants to be, grounded in Brazil. Dang it. With the clock ticking, waiting on his co-pilot. I'm gonna be meeting Corey for the first time this morning. He's supposed to be down here at 5.30 so we can get a good and early start, but so far, no Corey. Carrie's flown almost two-thirds of this trip with another pilot. I would like to ditch in front of a cruise ship because we'd be in the hot tub with a margarita within the hour. Or do I shut off the gas? <laughs> but that pilot had to bail because of a schedule conflict. I'm done. This is the end of the line. And for Carrie, the only thing worse is finding out the replacement is a guy he's never even met, his boss. You're going to come all the way down here to take my spot? done tons of trips like these all by myself and far more dangerous far more difficult to have someone come down here to help me it just drives me nuts hey good morning, good morning. speak all right how we doing pretty good pretty good as company owner corey benson's priority is keeping customers on side by delivering on time and carrie's already one step ahead the airport closes at eight from eight to noon we're either out here by 8, and we're staying. Let's go around the here on that side. This flight is Corey's chance to crack Brazil, one of the fastest growing small plane markets in the world. I know Kerry wanted to do this by himself, but the first flight into a new country is so important for us. If they're happy, they may tell a couple people. If they're pissed off, they're going to tell the world. And Corey's client expects the plane at his Brazilian ranch in less than 48 hours. I'm going to go check weather and file a flight plan. If you want to get her untied, um, either go in the office right there or talk to the guy with the truck. Carrie and Corey are still finding their feet as a team, and it's costing them precious time. Oh, we got to pay the landing fees, too, so yeah. A scheduled airport closure leaves them less than an hour to get off the ground. If we don't get out of here by 8 o'clock, we're stuck till probably tomorrow, because by noon, we won't have enough time to finish the legs we need to get done today. Today's plan is ambitious. Log more than 1,800 kilometers over dense Brazilian jungle, where landing strips are scarce if it all goes bad. All right, we're all set. It's a 10-hour day that puts them down just before sunset but only if they're wheels up within minutes. Oh. We got 30 minutes to get off the ground. All right, let's, let's get this moving. The plane they're delivering is a Beechcraft Bonanza. Carrie's brought it almost 5,000 kilometers with no mechanical problems. Ah, uh, no. Until now. We do not have time to dink around with this. What the hell? We got no power for the plane. Well, if we can't get this started in a couple of minutes, then it means we're staying here for a while. Do you want me to go see if the fuel truck has a jumper? Corey and Carrie now have 15 minutes before the runway closes. No time to install a new battery. Why would I have a totally dead there? Here he is. We need to get jumped and get out of here. Can you jump us? Don't see him. We're having a really difficult time communicating. I'm not sure if they know what we need, but we have less than 10 minutes to get the airplane jumped in off the ground. He has no idea what I'm trying to say. Battery dead. We need to plug in. Yeah. Mm. Got that? Dang. We got to hurry, though. They're <laughs> closing the runway. Time we got. We really do only have a few minutes. Emergency troubleshooting goes with the territory, but it's easier if you know the guy you're in deep with. Corey's usual go-to guy is a veteran pilot, Randy McGee. That light means we have 10 minutes left of fuel. Holy Together, Corey and Randy have been through hell 
And what was that? And high water. But right now, Randy's on another mission in Canada's far north. He's here trying out for the ferry flight of a lifetime. Dave? Sir. Hey, it's Randy McGeehee. Randy, nice to finally meet you. Nice man. to meet you How's too. The United Nations needs this plane in Africa to help save lives in South Sudan, the world's newest country. And the twin engine Dornier is perfect for the job. It carries twice the cargo of other turboprops and can nail a short runway, paved or not. Ideal for the rough and tumble world of UN relief missions. We can land this thing fully loaded in 500 feet, so you can get her stopped pretty quick. Wow. If you come in slow. That's impressive. Randy's at the bottom of a steep learning curve. I haven't seen anything like that. He's never flown a Dornier, and he's got just two days to learn. And even though he's racked up an impressive 10,000 plus hours of flying time, the Dornier will force him to up his game. When I learned he was an airline pilot, I had concerns. Randy flies a 767, I mean, that's a big jet. But if you even talk to Randy, how much does he actually fly the aircraft? Well, not really, you push a button and it sort of does its magic, right? To jump into something like this now, where you're actually hands and feet back to old school, what he used to do, if you haven't done it for a long time, anyone's gonna get rusty. Aircraft flight manual here. Your standing operating procedures. The uh, company operations manual is there. Looks pretty bad, man. <laughs> it is a lot of info. It's a lot of reading. There is, but uh, you're an airline pilot, man. You can figure it out. It's like a fire hose in the mouth. It's a lot of information, and you got to take it in as quickly as you can get it. We'll give Randy as much assistance as we can, but he's going to have to pick up the ball and run with it himself. I've got nine other airplanes I'm worrying about all over the world. Shortly after you guys are all done for the day. Done for the day. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling the pressure on everything I got to learn. It's a lot, and it's a big responsibility. It's a big step up for the Dornier, too. Its latest posting was hauling passengers and cargo around Canada's north. But for its new war zone tour of duty, the Dornier got a nose to tail upgrade. UN branding, the latest in navigation systems, and a brand new coat of armor. The main gear's got clamshell doors that clip up and seal it right in. We have a Kevlar coating on the belly. So this is bulletproof, basically. So we've got all our markings on United Nations under this wing and on the top of the left wing. They're very specific on where they want to be. There's also a UN under the belly that hopefully means don't shoot. I wonder if that gives us much protection at all, though. I guess for those who can read uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, don't have a problem with the UN. The last part of this trip, we're going into a really unstable part of the world. There's a lot of areas that we want to avoid overflying and definitely don't want to land in. So this is your basic layout. We got our normal checklist here. All right, so where's the autopilot at? We don't have autopilot, so. There's no autopilot on this plane? So we're going to hand fly this thing like 9,000 miles. <laughs> I didn't know that. On top of having to learn all the emergency procedures, normal procedures, and everything else, now I've got to be going back, reverting back to my old flying and, and having to concentrate on just flying the airplane. I don't think I've flown a plane like this without an autopilot or flight director since 10, 15 years ago. It's just a different style of flying. This is all hands and feet, so you do get lazy. I mean, I, I flew for the airlines, and, and yeah, you, you lose your, your hands and feet flying. And here, it's all we do. We don't have autopilots, so, you know, we're landing on some, you know, sometimes a 1,500-foot ice strip, so you're really flying the bus. You know the old saying, you can make, you know, hundreds of errors, but you just can't make any mistakes. Now, if he can't do the job, then he's not going. It's as simple as that. For ferry pilot Randy McGeehee, it's all or nothing. His rare shot at delivering a United Nations plane to Africa all comes down to these next few minutes. Our company 207. 207, this company, go ahead. Taxing out for a training flight with Randy. All right, man, your brakes, your control. Out of the airplane. Randy's never flown a Dornier. Let's do it. 
how this airplane lands and flies will be just a little different. You want to have that finesse and good hands, but it's not always that easy. Power set. Airspeed's alive both sides. You have two good engines. To ace this test, Randy has to respond to every tilt and roll of the plane. It's all about having the perfect touch. All right, man, it's your plane. Just back around, get used to it, that's fun. That rolls quick. I'm actually not used to that, that's cool. Yeah, very responsive, isn't it? It's like a Ferrari. I was expecting it to be a little more stable, to be honest. This ain't no ball. The Dornier is old school flying. All hands and feet, no autopilot. Randy puts the Dornier through its paces, turns, climbs, and some of the scarier stuff. You want to run a stall or stop or just call stall max power? Stall max power. We're set. Climbing right out of it pretty good. Yeah, you don't need to pitch for it at all. It'll, yeah. just, it'll just power right through it. Let's go. Way overpowered this airplane's off. All right, sweet. Well, for no autopilot, you're doing pretty good, man. Well, <laughs> no V bar, we're talking about no flight directors. I'm like, I'm actually going to have to start flying again. Not having any issues with this thing. For all the airline pilots, though, he's terrible. He's terrible. <laughs> I was expecting him to be rusty, especially on his altitude control. And he was nailing his altitude, even in a steep turn. I'm looking, and he's got it just on the rails going around the corner. Randy's hand flying is impressive. But the most challenging part is just ahead. The Dornier was built for balance. Heavy cargo in the rear, and passenger bags in the specially designed nose. Putting that nose down gently takes a skillful hand. The nose is going to want to drop out on you. So you got to really catch it, OK? Don't let it just go bang. Just feel it. The nose will come down, let it just sort of drop by itself, and then just check it back hard. All right, I'll try, man. And use as much as you want so you can figure out where the wheels are. All right. Stuff plus 15 looking good. I'm looking sweet. Very nice, sir. That was outstanding, brother. Thanks, man. I was working for it, though. Yeah, I gotta right. say, I was working for it. Randy's earned his seat on the Dornier. But more than 8,000 kilometers south, Randy's colleague, Corey Benson, is still stuck on the ground. Yeah, anyone else we should talk to, do you think? Corey and senior pilot, Kerry McCauley, have one dead battery and a runway about to close. Others scramble to beat the deadline. Corey and Carrie's chances of getting a jump start for their Beechcraft Bonanza are slipping away. I don't know, I think they're broke down too. Oh, well, maybe he's gonna pull the battery? I'm yeah, that guys... is too close. <laughs> Somehow, despite a serious language barrier, the locals have figured out the foreigners need a boost. Oh, you're just gonna swap them? Or no, okay, I see. They've pulled a working battery okay. to jolt the Bonanza out of its coma. Good, good. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Oh, man, talk about cutting it close. <laughs> Jeez. Because it is 8 o'clock right now. Where? Oh. Jesus. <laughs> a good co pilot is like a relief pitcher always ready to take over the game. Gary, with uh, this being the first time that uh, we've flown together, what do you want me doing? How do you want uh, the cockpit to get to work out? You know, I do have quite a bit more experience. I guess, you know, I'd, I'd like to be the captain, but I always work as a team. And Kerry needs to know what kind of a teammate Corey's going to be. Within the first minute, we got to get it figured out. We don't have time to get to know each other and, and time to figure out how each other flies. You really never know what another pilot's going to be like until you fly with him. I need a guy that's going to, you know, keep his cool, be good in an emergency. A good way to find out what your co-pilot's made of 
is to see how he handles an unexpected adrenaline rush, like buzzing the Amazon at treetop level. Okay, let's drop her down here a little bit and uh, do a little yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Too much fun. This is awesome. Oh, man, I love this stuff. Who gets to do this? Who gets to buzz the Amazon first thing in the morning? So I think he just wanted to make sure that I'm not going to be some wimp pilot because this is definitely not the job for, for a wimpy pilot. Uh, he passed with flying colors. He was digging it. We were having a ball. A couple of kids in a candy store was what we were. <laughs> oh, this is fun. All right, let's get back to work. They got places to go. Good that you came down to help out, though. I'm so happy I'm here. This is awesome. In this tiny airborne clubhouse, Corey's passed the initiation. Far north of the equator, in Canada's Northwest Territories, Randy McGee's also made the cut. We're ready to hit the skies. I can't wait to get airborne, you know? The veteran pilot has mastered the Dornier systems, earning a place in the cockpit on a demanding United Nations flight. The pressure's on us. We've got to get the plane over there. It's a risky trip. From the far north, they'll cross the rough North Atlantic, then over continental Europe into the heart of Africa. More than 12 and a half thousand kilometers. One spare of everything. Randy's used to being called Captain, but on this flight, he'll answer to Dave Matheson. Ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do this. 7202, take off runway 10. Clip take off runway 10, 7202. All right, brother, you have control. Is that nice power? Uh, power for altitude. Uh, 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 got two good engines. Goodbye, Yolnik. I love this machine, man. <laughs> <laughs> Position Director Keller maintained manner down in control from the 2 The first leg stretches nearly 2,300 kilometers to the remote northern community of Ikaluit. Well, we're not Kansas anymore, man. There is nothing around here but tundra and water. We're 15 miles. I've got some type of light ahead, but that could be anything right now. Got it. Yeah, sit down. It's kind of blurry. Still some clag in the way. I don't even worry about it, though. I just flies in numbers. They're putting down for the night to refuel the plane and themselves. at this time of year, huh? Warm is minus 20. To avoid a mammoth de-icing job, the plane must be towed indoors. Delivering planes is the ultimate in no-frills flying, where you're not just the pilot, you're also the ground crew. It's just a pain in the ass, because it's freezing out there. You're tired from the flight. You know you have an early morning, and uh, we're having to do our own work. The joys of Arctic travel. What little sleep they get here, they'll need. In front of them is a 10,000 kilometer marathon with the finish line in a combat zone. By the next day, sleep is a distant memory. It's been long hours of jockeying this United Nations Dornier on its trip to Africa. Hey, I want to see Greenland here. It looks cool, or at least. Yeah, but it's not clouded over, it is man. Now at the one quarter mark, they're approaching Greenland. 
Yeah, once we cross these rocks, that glacier, and then it's hitting the bay there, that'd be cool. Randy sees a photo op, but after hours of butt-numbing boredom, they start coming up with a hole right through the middle of it. Dave sees a slalom course. Minimums, minimums. It's just for fun. Still, skimming this ice field requires absolute precision. Too low terrain. Here, the nimble Dornier shows what it's made of. Quick and responsive. So is Dave, who honed skills like this competing in aerobatics. The most fun I can do in an airplane really is, is aerobatics. That's a real test. You know, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of practice, a lot of training. Dave has great hands. He can manipulate that airplane and make it do whatever he wants. I have a lot of respect for that. With the icebergs in their rear view, it's back to the business of rationing fuel for the long trip ahead. Are we there yet? <laughs> it's gonna be a long trip for you, my friend. Yeah, big time. In the lower latitudes, above Brazil, Corey Benson is learning that the co in co-pilot is short for cooperate. Usually it's helpful that, you know, one of us is doing the navigating, so, you know, if you want to... Okay. Look, ...looking up frequencies and uh, stuff like that. Okay, gotcha. Generally, when we're on other ferry flights, we switch back and forth, but he definitely likes to, to be the captain. He's in the left seat, and that's the way it is. They push into the heart of Brazil, and at the end of 1,800 kilometers, the Beechcraft Bonanza is ready for a fuel up. You wanna do this one? Kerry likes to drive, but in an emergency, he might have to hand over the reins. Sure. Which is why he needs to see Corey in action. As I recall, that's the runway that you come over a hill and a, a road and a fence. And as you touch down, the whole runway is downhill. So it's kind of tough to land on. You need to have your speed under control. You don't want to be going any faster than 75, 8, the max. This is Corey's chance to show Kerry that he's more than just a passenger. Go ahead your traffic, Bonanza, 5603 Mike. Turning left downwind, 13, go ahead and Looks like it's a quartering tailwind from the left. A little high, dump full flaps. With a tailwind and a sloping runway, Corey needs to keep a lid on his speed. Okay, gas, three green undercarriage, make sure props pumps, you're really fast. You're 90. 95. Corey's coming in too hot and too high. Watch your speed. At this speed and altitude, he'll overshoot the runway. Okay, let's hang, hang a hard right. Kerry calls off the landing. So you're thinking it's best to come in the other yeah, way? Yeah, upwind's best, but we gotta be on the numbers and stuff. Okay, let's uh, get some power back though. We're doing 110 now. Here, you got it. All right, slower up. Here, we're doing 100. It's gonna be a right crosswind. Looking better this time, doing 90, but you're more on the glide path there. Corey's got the situation under control, but Carrie's still riding him. Here, I'll watch your speed. 85, 80, 75, 70, up your nose. At the last second, Kerry cuts the power and takes control of the plane. Flaps coming up. I got the brakes. I have the plane. Nicely done. You got the door. Unless it's life or death, seizing control from another pilot is bad form. Yeah, sorry about that power thing. I shouldn't have done that. That's all right. I got a little carried away. <laughs> Airspeed was fine, everything was fine, and, and he went and just chopped the throttle. Um, you don't reach over and take controls unless there's a, a danger, which there definitely wasn't a danger. I kind of screwed up his landing by cutting his power a little bit. But, you know, flying from the right seat is tough. This runway's got a big hill on it, and, uh, yeah, it was no big deal. Corey may be Kerry's boss, but in the cockpit, the guy with the most experience is top dog, period.
Why is the power still on? Yeah, let's let's get out to the battery quick. So this morning, the plane needed a jump start. Now, a reverse problem. They can't power down. Battery will drain in no time. Hot. It's like pulling the keys from your car ignition to find the radio still on. You want to hand me my knife? Carrie suspects a critical electrical wire is somehow stuck. Oh, did that do it? Something went. Because I, I turned on the master yeah. and I turned it off, but everything's still lit up. Try it again. Everything's still lit up, huh? Well, that's not good. Beats the hell out of me. Handing over damaged goods is bad for business, especially when you're trying to break into a hot new market like Brazil. The first thing that's going to go through the new owner's mind is, is it something that our pilots or that we did? And we definitely don't want that. Ah, it's a new one on me. Yeah, I've never seen that before. There's not much time to solve this mystery. The owner wants his plane in less than 24 hours. Now, in Egypt, Randy and Dave are facing trouble of their own. Morning, dude. Super Dave. How's it going, bro? Good, man. How's your sleep? Really great, actually. How about you? I've been up since one, crunching numbers. In four days, they've come 9,700 kilometers. But it's the last 3,000 that they're really worried about. Flying over war-ravaged South Sudan. Flight planners have us take in uh, six hours and 37 minutes. And we have seven hours of fuel. 23 minutes reserve, which is not enough. Yeah, that's not going to work. Even with a full tank, their assigned flight plan from Egypt to South Sudan leaves them barely enough gas to finish the trip. Pilots call it fuel critical. So if we get any kind of a headwind, basically we won't make it. So I've been racking my brain all night trying to figure out how to make it work. If we can get any kind of a tailwind, it'll increase it to probably about 40 to 45 minutes of fuel, which is perfect, but a headwind will, we won't make it. What other options do we have? I checked didn't even land the cartoon. It's not an option. They said, don't bother. It takes 48 hours to get permission, and it's sketchy. Yeah, it's not my first option. We don't have any other place to go, though, huh? There's no friendly place to land between here and there. It's you know, almost 1,200 miles. And when we start up, we need an immediate taxi and also an immediate turn on course. Yep. Otherwise, they could vector us out 100 miles before they get us on course. We don't have them. So hopefully they play ball. From the moment they switch on their engines, they're eating into their already slim fuel reserve. All right, man, fuel's critical. We need to take off as soon as possible. Roger. Summit 202, request take position. We're ready to take off. But the guy in the control tower has other ideas. Negative. Damn it. Meanwhile, it's early morning in Brazil, and Corey Benson and Kerry McCauley are troubleshooting. Hours later, they're no further ahead. Here's the start. Make sure not to burn this battery down. Their plane is sucking power, and not even the mechanic knows why. I'm hearing the clunk, so something's working. Something's happening. But it's not happening fast enough. Right now, the only way to turn off the power to the plane is to pull the plug on the battery. It ain't perfect. Definitely unhooking the battery every time you shut the plane off is not uh, an ideal situation, but especially delivering it to the new owner. I and know, have to get out you know, and disconnect the battery. That's going to kill me if I got to say, it's got one little quirk. You got to disconnect the battery every time you shut the plane off. It's a safety Ooh, feature, it's though. Safety. <laughs> it's an anti-theft device. Yeah. The plane's owner is expecting delivery in just a couple of hours. I'm going to call the owner real quick, um, just give him an update. Just going to send the owner an email. I tried to call him on his numbers and couldn't get through. I think he's a little anxious to, to get his airplane. Delivering a temperamental plane is better than no plane at all. Corey decides to push on right after a quick refuel. 
Huh, it turned off. The master switch, when I turned it off, all the power went off, so everything's cold, huh? Yeah. Cool. We fixed it. <laughs> you gotta love it when a plan comes together. When something breaks and then it fixes itself. For me, that's the scariest part because you never know when it's gonna break again, but it is gonna break again. And it's generally at the very worst place when it stops working again. This is looking really good. We got guys giving us gas. The master switch is working again. We got a beautiful day and only two hours left to go. We're golden, baby. We're not even gonna be late. That's like the first time. Hey, hey Carrie, we're not in the air yet. Huh? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. That's true. We are out of here. In Egypt, Randy McGeehy and Dave Matheson are wasting fuel, desperate to get off the ground. They run for 202 line up via Charlie. Runway 17, accept? Sure. Accept it, sir? Yeah, accept it. They're sent to the far side of the airport to await permission to take off. Another gas-guzzling delay. We're trying to take off and get out of here quick, and he's not helping us. Their flight plan leaves them only 23 minutes of reserve fuel. Every second on the ground will cost them in the air. Clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. Initiative 212 from Alpha November, VOR. I'm at 202. All right, buddy. You ready, hot shot? I'll oh, say, let's get going. Finally, they get clearance to take off. Clear for 202, airborne time 1-8. Have a nice day. Their plane, a Dornier, is a strong climber. But in the desert, the air temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. The plane's engines are having to work harder, burning through the gas. So hot, man. Our performance is we're getting killed. Worse, the guys in the control tower have assigned them a flight plan that looks more like a cow trail. Dave radios air traffic control, asking for a more direct route to save on fuel. Sir, Summit 202, is there any chance you could approve us direct Golf, Oscar, Papa, Delta, Alpha, just because we we're fuel critical on this leg, sir, and it would help us out a lot. Be nice to us, buddy. Please, uh, after contact with Sky Radar, you can uh, take this clearance, uh, zero from 202. It's bad news. Yeah, by the time we get to 110, it won't matter. We're uh, fuel critical. Air traffic control has ordered them to climb to 11,000 feet, contact another control tower, and try again. Can help, man. Friggin' 100 miles in the wrong direction is not gonna help. It's 45 degrees off our track. It's nice when you're sitting on the ground, yeah. air conditioning, and you're not up here worrying about running out of fuel, you know? Thirty minutes later, they're in airspace controlled by another tower. Cairo, good morning. Share uniform 202-110. Request present position direct. Golf, Oscar, Papa, Delta, Alpha. Fuel critical. I can't give you permission to overfly direct to this point. All I can do with you is to proceed direct to New Bar. November uniform, Bravo, Alpha, Romeo. That's straight in the frickin' line. Translation, request denied again. That's why it won't turn us. I mean, he probably can't even work with Sudan airspace, you know? Randy and Dave will get one last shot at shaving time off this trip, but not until the halfway point. And with just 23 minutes of spare fuel to begin with, halfway could come too late. In the skies above Brazil, this Beechcraft Bonanza is trouble-free after some earlier power problems. It's a lot more mellow in the cockpit as well. What the hell is that? A Korg, meet Hula Girl. <laughs> Hula Girl was with me on all my ferry trips when I was, uh, when I was a young lad. And uh, she's kind of <laughs> like my good luck charm, so I always bring her with on all my trips. Unfortunately, you Hula break Girl, your leg one day? Well, Hula Girl had an accident. <laughs> I 
Pretty interesting there, buddy. Yeah, well, we've all got our quirks. <laughs> you gotta have somebody to talk to on the long flights. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Kerry prefers flying solo, and he's been adjusting to a co-pilot who's also the boss. But after tens of thousands of kilometers with Hula Girl, Kerry's beginning to appreciate the live audience. Have you had any emergencies, Kerry? Well, yeah. Lost an engine in a 182 hauling jumpers. Lost an engine in a Queener hauling jumpers. Lost my alternator at night over the Sahara ferry flying. Was lost over the jungle in the middle of Africa ferry flying. Lost my ferry tank fuel pressure system in the middle of the Atlantic at night while ferry flying. Yeah, so you've I've had some you've emergencies. You've had a couple. Wow. You should read my book. Do you really have a book? Yeah, I'm almost done. Oh, this is going to be like a whole new chapter now. Oh, I know. I can't decide if I'm going to add this to it yeah, or you you have it a second book, you know? Oh, my God. Oh, like, it's like, my life doesn't stop. I can't finish the damn book. <laughs> Just keep it. <laughs> After more than 8,700 kilometers over stormy seas and dense jungle, the Bonanza is now within sight of the new owner's ranch. All right, how's my mixture is good, gas is good. All eyes will be on them. The landing needs to be perfect. But the runway is far from it. That's definitely not a international airport runway. It's gonna be a little challenging. Hey, remember here, Kerry, no pressure, but uh, the owner is watching you. Ah, oh good, at least I got that going for me, no pressure and all. Above the African desert, landing is the last thing Randy and Dave want to do right now. We're fuel critical on this leg to make Juba. Is there any possibility we could get direct? They alert air traffic control as they approach Sudan. It's a war zone. Putting down here could get them kidnapped or worse. We just did one hour. We burned 656 pounds. I'll get back to that in a second. Short on gas, Randy and Dave have been asking for a more direct flight path. Twice denied, they have one last chance. Sir, no copy from Khartoum at all. Could you read it? They can't raise air traffic control on the radio. Awesome, we're in hostile airspace and we can't talk to anybody. After several attempts, finally, they make contact. Seven, four, two, zero, two, radar contact. Would you say again your request? And sir, from uh, Sierra Uniform 202, any chance for direct Romeo Alpha Bravo Alpha Kilo? We are fuel critical. I say again, we will be fuel critical. It is imperative we get a straighter line than this. That means go ask your boss, dipped. Come on, baby, give it to us. Negative, military area. Thanks for no help. What a dick. And he knows we're fuel critical. You know he could give it to us. And we're a United Nations flight. We're not there to bomb anybody. Out of options, they're banking on a smooth flight with no surprises. And in ferry flying, that's asking for a miracle. Eighty-five. Above Brazil, Corey Benson knows there's a lot riding on these next few seconds. It's his first delivery into the Brazilian market, his red carpet moment. But the runway is a dirt patch roller coaster. Oh, he's got a fence stand too. Flaps coming up. Well done, well done. Whew. What an entrance. Look, that was a little more nerve wracking than I was anticipating. That was sporty. Excellent. Wow, this is beautiful here. Woo. Hi, how are you? 
Very nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Huh? This is beautiful here. Yeah, you did it. Beautiful. A good trip. Phenomenal. Tip. Aha. Nice, huh? First time to get to see it, yeah. First time I touch it. Very good. I like the. Girl. That's not enough. That's, uh, <laughs> that's my Willow Girl, eh? <laughs> think you brought the gift for me? No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's toast, huh? Yeah. Hey, yeah, to the new plane. To the, the new, new plane. plane. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Congratulations. The delivery of the for, bonanza. For all our, yeah. Yeah. Cheers, Toast. This is probably the best welcome that I've ever had, delivering airplanes. These people have just been so incredibly generous and, and excited and um, you know this is a passion of his that's one of the fun parts about uh, delivering some of these smaller planes he's going to be using this him and his wife and his family coming to the ranch just like what we did here and it's, it's just a, a great welcome oh, oh we're going to be like that are we? <laughs> Over Africa, a run of bad luck has finally turned around for Randy McGeehy and Dave Matheson. 195, we picked up a couple knots. Not great, but I'll take it. They started this flight with just 23 minutes of fuel to spare, what pilots call fuel critical. But Mother Nature's thrown them a bone, a tailwind that lets them ease up on the throttle and use less fuel. Every knot helps. Try to squeeze 200 knots out of this thing if we can. 197. To bleed every ounce of mileage from the Dornier, Randy and Dave need to work this plane super efficiently. I mean, we look like we're trimmed out perfect, so our drag's as low profile as possible. We got up as cool as we can, gives us cool engines, less fuel flow off our engines, so that gives better range and endurance. I can't think of anything else I can do right now. We really got to start calculating that fuel. We're already losing our tailwind. Speeds dropped to 193. Damn it. That's not what we want to see. Damn it. We're down, down to 300 pounds reserve right now. But that's doing direct. That's not with all this horse. They got us going. Even with every fuel saving trick in the book, the detours ordered by air traffic control have been sucking the gas. 300 pounds of fuel left, that means we have 15 minutes. 15 minutes of spare fuel leaves them no margin for error. We've lost another three knots already since you started this fuel calculation. Everything's trending against us right now. We're losing time, we're losing airspeed, we're burning more fuel. It's not looking real good. And the view out their front windscreen is worse. Look at this, man. Damn it. In Africa, storms can be sudden and fierce. Randy's about to get his first taste. We can't go around that. We're going to have to pick our way through it. The plane is too low on fuel to dodge this storm. They have to hit it head on. Bro, that's bad. That was a that that bad. Dude, that this is lazy. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Battery dead. Across distances they were never meant to fly. The joys of Arctic travels. To the most isolated spots on the planet. Losing an engine over the jungle is definitely something that you want to avoid. Weather is the enemy. Dude, that is That risk is real, and it's it's waiting for you. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn... If it has wings, we'll fly it. They'll live to fly another day. Dude, lightning. You see that? Yeah. 12,000 feet over Africa. Randy McGee and Dave Matheson are caught in a heavy storm. And their twin-engine Dornier is low on fuel. 
dude, we're in all sorts of trouble right now, man. I mean, wicked returns. I'm just punching us through it right now. They started in Yellowknife, Canada. Eight fuel stops and 13,000 kilometers later, they're on the last leg of their mission to deliver the Dornier to the United Nations in South Sudan. This thing just came out of nowhere. A storm eats up fuel. Randy and Dave have asked permission to fly around it. But in this part of Africa, nothing's that simple. All right, Speed, come on, pick up now. You know, man, storms in Africa are legendary, and this one doesn't look good. When they left Egypt, they already knew fuel would be tight on this long last leg of their trip. All right, man, fuel's critical. We need to take off. Two zero two, request take position. We're ready to take off. Negative. All right. Air traffic controllers refuse to let them take shortcuts over conflict zones. Is there any chance you could approve us direct? Negative. What a dick. I say again, we will be fuel critical. It is imperative we get a straighter line than this. That means go ask your boss, dipped. I can't give you a permission. With less than an hour worth of fuel to spare, they push on through. I've had to go pretty far off course. Actually, it's settling down better than I thought now, but the radar looks bad. You'll get some more bumps coming up here, but it won't be nothing crazy. Well, look at this, man. Now we're getting back on course here. The storm blew out of nowhere. Now, just as suddenly, it's dying down. It's gonna be awesome, man. We're gonna land in Juba, the newest country in the world after coming from the Arctic. That's pretty cool, man. Totally. Six years of work to get this thing to Juba. The Dornier 228 is a heavy hauler that can land on the worst African dirt airstrips. I'll be excited once we get there. Hi guys. How are you? I'm Welcome in. to Juba, South Sudan. Thank you. This is Carlos. Hello, Carlos, Carlos Randy. Randy. Nice to meet you. Too. Nice to meet you. Work especially with him and his people. The plane will join the fleet of the United Nations World Food Program, transporting aid workers and supplies all over South Sudan. This flight was like none other that I've ever done because I honestly believe this airplane being here is going to save people's lives and it's going to help people and make their country better and make their lives better. And uh, it meant something to me to be a part of that. Randy and Dave's job is done. For the Dornier, the real work now begins. Helping the world's newest country get on its feet. Back in the US, on the east coast of Florida. Guaranteed, and if we don't? Boss Corey Benson is busy lining up Randy's next job. Whatever, okay, bye. Now we can't leave tomorrow. We don't have insurance. They, they guaranteed me I'd have it yesterday, then they guaranteed me we have it today so we could leave tomorrow morning, and we can't go. Corey's a pilot, but lately he's become a risk-taking entrepreneur, selling and delivering planes around the world. Looks pretty good. It looks like they just updated and put a Garmin 530 in it, which is a much nicer GPS. Corey has a lot riding on this delivery. Oh, master on? Yeah, master on. For the second time in as many months, he's tackling the world's hottest market for small planes. Brazil is really hot right now. Um, their economy's doing really well. There's a lot of people buying airplanes, so we put a big emphasis down there. It really gives us the edge, and it's, it's helped us build this company very quickly. Nav light. Strobe. Corey has less than 48 hours to make sure this plane is ready to go before Randy shows up. And this is not the only delivery Corey has on his books. He's got another job lined up, across the Atlantic. Right. And he's hired two new pilots to take on this flight. Hey, hey. Hey. What's up, Rockstar? What's going on? 
How you doing, Show man? some man love, brother. How you doing? Good. Pete Zaccanino comes highly recommended. There's nothing better than being the business owner and knowing that you have pilots like Pete that can fly anything and has flown everything. Um, he was a test pilot for half the planes out there, it seems like. So it's, it's an incredible, almost a bragging right to be able to say that uh, Pete's one of my pilots. Pete is one of the busiest and best pilots in the U.S. Gloves, helmet, oxygen. He races jets, and he's a test pilot. In most cockpits, that makes him a top gun. Pete will be flying this mission with Brad White, a younger pilot with less flying time, but eager to learn. If there was anyone that I could say in my career that could be a mentor, it would be him. Because he's done more, he's flown more airplanes than anyone I've ever flown with. But for veteran Pete, there's a dark cloud hanging over this mission. What happened at Reno? This is it nuts, was, man. Yeah, it was bad. Friend of yours? Yeah, yeah, I knew Jimmy. It was a bad deal. Four days ago, at an air show in Reno, Nevada, Pete witnessed a very personal tragedy. One of his friends crashed his plane into the stands, killing himself and 10 spectators. This is a catastrophic failure. This is bad. Oh, man, so but you're, you're feeling OK? Uh, you're... Yeah, you got to move forward. And... It sucks, but uh, you know, it happens. Yeah, it does suck. It was, so it was pretty horrible. A tragedy at Reno, as sad as it is, and unfortunate as it is, does not shake me. You have to move forward from it. You cannot be looking back at it, because fear will kill your mind. And if you're establishing fear in your mind from a tragedy and observing a tragedy, you shouldn't fly. So this is it right here. Hey, I like it a lot. Hey, it's actually, I was a little concerned about it. I didn't know if it was in good shape or if it was an old uh, beater that we had to, to, to move. It looked pretty nice. The plane they have to move is a twin-engine King Air, a $2 million eight-seater with some major modifications. The King Air is the beast. It's an earlier King Air. It's in good shape, but they put in these big motors. So this thing is uh, raging. It wants to get up and go fly. And there's plenty of flying ahead. 7,500 kilometers from the UK to Iceland and Greenland, on to Canada, and finally south to Quincy, Illinois, four days from now. And our flaps are up. Those are some white cliffs. Those are some white cliffs. Did you ever think you'd be in the king here at 2,000 feet off the uh, cliffs of Dover? I actually did not. I'm just saying. Kind of cool, though. That's very cool. Cool to the left. But the sightseeing is cut short when Pete notices something wrong. Right field gauge is not reducing. OK. This one's dropped down, you know, where it's at. This one doesn't move. One of the plane's fuel gauges is still showing a full tank, but they've already been flying for half an hour. I think we're going to cut our flight short. That is a good call. King Air 7 Quebec, Romeo Roger. We're going to start our turnaround or return to shore. A faulty fuel gauge is bad enough, but Pete knows it could be a sign of a more serious problem. Capitan! Corey B. Nice ride. In Florida, a tired but upbeat Randy McGee shows up for his new mission. How's it going, man? Good. It's hot. Corey Benson gave Randy short notice on this delivery job. So how you doing, Randy? I know you had a long all-nighter to get here. Man, I haven't slept much. I haven't eaten for like 16 hours, but uh, I'll be all right. I owe a lot of the success of my business to Randy. He really helped me get up. Um, get this company off the ground and, and delivering these planes. There's no way I could have delivered some of these planes without him. The plane looks good. It's just been this insurance nightmare. For the last week, it's been complete bull****, but we, we finally have it settled, so we're ready to go. 
There she is. As Corey's designated expert pilot, Randy's job is to get the plane and its crew to their destination, alive. My part of that process is to move this airplane and make sure the airplane gets there safely. If, if we don't deliver the plane, we didn't do our job either. The plane is a 1991 Beechcraft Bonanza, a high-performance aircraft with a deadly reputation for killing inexperienced pilots. These are the doctor killers, huh? <laughs> that won't be a problem for us, because I barely made it out of high school, man, so. <laughs> In the late 40s, the first Bonanzas came with a V-tail that reduced the drag on the plane. But the design also came with a high fatality rate. A lot of guys died in this, but really the theory is that doctors are very confident and put themselves in situations that they thought they could handle, but obviously couldn't. And Just in over their head, get their pilot's license, so. and then go buy a high-performance complex plane. After the V-tail got too much bad press, it was discontinued in 1982. I think we got to take it flying here. I mean, it definitely looks like an old plane. If Randy sounds skeptical, it's because he knows what lies ahead. A 6,000-kilometer-long trek from Florida to Cuiabá, Brazil, with six pit stops and a treacherous pass over the dense jungle of the Amazon. The only way to find out if this bonanza is up for it is to get it off the ground. Clear. Clear. Capitan. All right, Corey, everything looks coupled up pretty good there. You're right. coming up. That gear's not. I didn't hear the gear, did you? That's not coming up. The gear's not coming up. We got a gear problem. The landing gear should retract into the belly of the plane but it won't budge. Is it stuck down? That doesn't make any sense. Rather be stuck down than up, but this isn't good. Jammed landing gear is especially bad right now. Corey doesn't have time for repairs. The insurance issues already have him behind schedule. Dude, this is ridiculous. After all the other delays, we cannot have another delay. If this landing gear is a problem, I'm going to be pissed. Hey, man, I don't even want to hear about it right now. we got to fix this problem and get it on the ground safely, and then we'll worry about the rest. So oh, this just drop it. Dude. This isn't the first time Corey and Randy have butted heads over their competing agendas. We need to get going, though. We have to get it there tonight. If Randy thinks Corey is putting his deadlines ahead of crew safety, we don't have to do anything. He doesn't hesitate to pull rank on the boss. If it gets too late, we'll just have to stay. And Tower uh, 91 Whiskey Echo would like to return for landing uh, with the possible gear failure. Making that delivery deadline now looks impossible. This is ridiculous. I understand, man. Let's just get it on the ground here first. High over the cliffs of Dover, Pete and Brad are test flying the King Air, a souped-up plane they call the Beast. What's our fuel flow? 250. Yeah, hey, a little under even. Getting it ready to fly all the way to Illinois. But Pete's just found a problem. Well, that fuel gauge definitely is not moving. A broken fuel gauge is a no-fly item. When we're in flight, if we developed a fuel leak, the only way often that we would know that is our fuel gauge. Pete isn't taking any chances. He's aborting the test flight. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. And that's the attitude I bring to that aircraft. The plane's trying to kill me. It's not my friend. And it has to prove to me it's safe. So we're sure that that uh, fuel gauge is just stuck? And well, not, yeah. not going into a nice imbalance? If the fuel is flowing to just one engine, the plane will be dangerously off kilter when they try to land. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right there. Yep. Pete banks the plane back and forth to rule that out. 
I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have a fuel imbalance going on and have to land with this massively heavy wing. That is a good call. Fuel imbalance would be bad enough on a test flight, but a disaster if it hit them on their longest leg. If we had that over the Atlantic and turned out to be a genuine fuel transfer issue, that can turn into a serious emergency where you could lose fuel to one engine. Okay, runway is tight. And we'll keep our eyes open for birds. Pete's first landing of the beast is a rocky one. I ah, like that bird right there. Nope. He and Brad have a long list for the mechanics. Gear doors on the left side, the co-pilot's audio is poor, and the right fuel gauge is sticking at 685 pounds. And uh, also, uh, it was a crappy landing. <laughs> The Beast handles a little bit differently than other King Airs because of the modifications. It's got bigger propellers up front, and that changes how it lands. It has a different feel to it. So I got a leash on it right now, but it still bites at my leg every now and then. Malcolm, what do you think for all those items to be up and running, ready to go? Well, we'll take a look at the fuel system straight away. OK. The plugs, uh, the socket's not going to be a problem. That's probably a connection there. We'll take a look now. OK. And then Great. come up with a plan. OK. Yeah, that sounds Great. good. The Beast will be a full day in the shop, a delay that won't sit too well with boss Corey Benson. I can't stress enough, guys, the urgency to get this plane to the new owner. He is needing this airplane extremely quickly for his business. Yeah, that's a Roger. I guess it's time to fly, get that plane fixed. Let's get in the air. Roger that. Two days later, Pete and Brad are back in the air, gunning for the airport in Reykjavik, Iceland. What do you think about coming in here at night? If it's dark, then we just shoot it as precisely as possible, because there's a lot of stuff to hit out there. Yeah. We have a lot of obstacles. We have mountains, volcanoes, and I'm tired. Since leaving the UK, they've logged about 1,100 kilometers in the King Air. The plane is performing well, but Pete still doesn't trust it enough to land after dark. When I don't know a plane, I don't trust it, and I tend to avoid night flying in that airplane until it proves to be a safe and reliable aircraft. Well, what we're going to do is turn everything up as fast as possibly to make this plane go. Even five minutes faster to get there is going to help and hopefully not land in the dark. Not the landing, it's all the obstacles and mountainous terrain. Pete opens up the throttle, pushing the King Air up to top speed. So he just gave us right there two knots by pushing the prop levers up to red line. And we're just coming up with ideas on what we can do to get there as fast as we can. The red line strategy works. Pete and Brad shave off enough time to arrive half an hour before sunset. Well, final, don't have the traffic. Turn left heading at 290, maintain 4,000 feet. To make this landing, they have to come in high or risk slamming into a mountain. Maintaining 4,000 feet with the field in sight. Check your altimeter setting at oh. showing at 3,000 feet. Oh, we totally blew that. They're 1,000 feet lower than they thought, too close to the ground. How many times do we brief that? That's what Dude. fatigue does to you. They've set their altimeter wrong. If it were dark, oh. After sundown, this simple mistake could have killed them both. Oh. This is not an airport you want to land at in the dark. It can be a brutal journey, and fatigue is always a factor. You're flying through time zones every day, you're tired, you're eating in different places, you're at different hotels, and that adds to your fatigue. Some people disregard that, and uh, there are ferry pilots that crash every year. Today, Pete's in luck. Their next stop is Greenland, but the airport is closed on Sunday, so they'll have a day off.
almost 6,000 kilometers southwest in Florida. Randy's worried that the plane he and Corey are flying to Brazil might have a serious problem. There we go. Access is the killer. Always is. The landing gear retracts perfectly, some of the time. But that's not good enough for Randy. No other red liar going to no. any relay. No, white's up at pin number five, and red is down. Corey makes an average $15,000 for each plane delivery, if it's trouble free. Every day we delay, it costs us money with pilot fees and hotels and everything else. And so from a business standpoint, I'm always pushing the pilots. Hey man, we're gonna be doing this a lot. This is gonna happen. We just gotta, it's important to me too, but it's just part of the business. It's the part of the business that drives me freaking nuts. <laughs> Everything works like it's supposed to. So, you know, if we can't find find the problem to duplicate it, we can't fix it. You know, that's as simple as that. You can't fix something that's not broken. As far as Corey is concerned, if the landing gear won't retract now and then, he's willing to fly with the wheels down. But Randy would rather have all systems working perfectly. Hey, fellas, what do we got? I mean, it didn't work. And then, yeah, it worked a bunch of times. And then it didn't work, and then it worked a bunch of times. And then that last time, it didn't work, and it just... What I'm saying, though, is, is, is as mechanics, if the system is working, yeah. I can't find the problem. You know, we're going to be launching into the Caribbean, and if it happens again, and we don't have real mechanics around, I mean, then we're... You know what I mean? start changing switches. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that's going to be Chuck's call. I mean, you know, what are you, you, you going to replace? Yeah. One, two, four, three, three, four, five switches, two relays. You're talking thousands of dollars. Replacing all the switches because they can't find the bad one is an expensive call that no one wants to make. The gear is working, but not at the level that it should be working at. We can fly the airplane as is, but we have to know that the system is uh, a little quirky, and it's not working, in my mind, entirely uh, correctly. Randy finally gives in. If the landing gear won't retract, the bottom line is the plane can still fly and land. So they're finally off to Brazil. Goodbye, Florida. Are you comfortable? You look like you're pretty straight up. Oh, yeah, you are. stick up my ass. <laughs> well, I've known that since. It's the first day I've met you. Right? Just let me know how you're doing. We just got to make sure we don't get on each other's nerves. But well, you're always on my nerves. I just don't tell you. Yeah, man. I mean, I've been on the road three weeks straight before we even came into this, so it'd be nice to have at least one day down, you know? Far up in chilly Reykjavik, Pete and Brad are supposed to be taking the day off. We'll be taming the beast a little bit more, you know? Kind of getting used to the feel of this guy. But both pilots would rather be flying. So Pete's going to train Brad for a dangerous landing that's coming up in their trip. Oh, we got like 20 knot winds or something right now, so we're just going to go and bust out some uh, practice crosswind landings. Tomorrow, they'll be flying to Narsarsuak, a landing strip with a nasty reputation. The top 10 most dangerous airports in the world is Narsarsuak, Greenland. And you need to be experienced and have uh, your knowledge of your aircrafts all set up before you get there. Narsarsuak is surrounded by steep cliffs that create powerful wind gusts. A strong crosswind could knock the King Air off course and send it crashing down onto the icebergs below. These crosswind landings, the wind is hitting you from one side of the airplane instead of right down the nose the way you like it. The plane likes to turn into the wind at all, all times. So what we're going to do here, instead of the plane's going to be coming to the runway on a big angle like this, and Pete is going to stand on the rudder and actually end up touching down one wheel and riding on one wheel, and then put the second wheel down, the main gear, and then the nose wheel. It'll be good practice for sure. Okay, I'm gonna get your lights here for you, big dog. Thank you. Both laps. Speed check selected, moving.
The first try for a one-wheel landing doesn't impress Brad. It kind of felt like they both touched at the same time. Well, you know what? You had this great slip going. It seemed right at the last minute you flattened it out. Had to to put that wing down. That sucks. All right, really roll around one, baby. Pete blows the next one. It won't do it, dude. Nope. I'm moving. Full flaps. Full flaps. Engage. But number three does the job. Oh, that was buttery, dude. Yeah, baby. That was buttery. Man, that was awesome. That was kick ass. That was dude, fun. You were killing those things. Good <laughs> job, man. Today, Brad and Pete head for Greenland, where they'll put yesterday's flying practice to the test. Hey, Pete, so I'm just reviewing some terrain charts here. They're 30 minutes from Narsarswak Airport, one of the most dangerous landings in the world, and Brad's got the controls. Could you give me a little rundown of what we might see? Yeah, we got an 8,000-foot uh, glacier that we have to contend with, so we can't just descend down. OK. Number two. The airport is in between mountains and in a fjord, okay? So we can't just set up nice and gradual for it. It's a steep approach. It has its terrain on left, right, and behind you and in front of you. So it's, it's rather intense, even if the weather's good. Also, there's icebergs right at the edge of the runway. All right. Pete's got a lot more experience with Narsarswak than myself. I'm familiar with uh, mountain flying and treacherous winds and all that from my flying in Alaska, but uh, the actual airport itself, they're all different. Doesn't matter where you've been, it's where you're going. So we're gonna be coming from up over here to send it down through all that crap, yeah. then have to go out over the water. Correct. And then there's icebergs in the way. Wow, we got our hands full for sure. For Brad, this is a rare chance to tackle the notorious airport but he's glad to have Pete standing by for backup. Let's hit it. All righty. Let's get down there and uh, have a good look at these glaciers. I want you to see how bad it is. This place is nuts. Look how many fjords you have, and you miss one, you pick the wrong one, you're dead. Yeah, this is crazy. Right now, they're headed toward what could be a layer of severe turbulence. On this arrival, we've got 20 knot winds, and that fjord, this is not a flying hippo, by the way. In that fjord, it can get really aggressive with the turbulence and wind shear. I figured as much. Oh. Yeah. There you go right there. On cue. As we go floating out of our seats. Woohoo! Ooh, slowing down. Eight minutes from the runway, turbulence rocks the King Air. Brad slows the plane and pulls the nose up to reduce stress on the wings. Good pitch just beauty up. Yep, I got it. Thank you, sir. And right at Q. That was unbelievable. When turbulence hits like that, the first thing that comes into my mind is the wings coming off. There's design speeds because the planes can only handle so much abuse. And just when things couldn't get any worse. We just get a faster warning for my jaw fluid low. My jaw fluid low. Might have a gear issue here, unfortunately. That's just great. That's terrific. If ever they needed their landing gear to work. You know what, why don't we drop the gear now? Make sure we don't have a problem when we're on Friday. Right, gear selected down. It's moving, we got a green on the nose. And uh, left and right. We got three green and no red. Okay, cool. Well, that's, that's sorted. The gear problem has disappeared. November 7, 8, Quebec Romeo, turning final runway 07. But ahead, more to deal with. We've got a long runway. It's windy, and it's going to have wind shear. Yep. So, what are you thinking for speed? There, there are some report. big, flipping uh, icebergs uh, out there. Holy smokes. 500. All right, let's go final flaps, please. Final flaps selected. Speed is good. With a cool head and a steady hand, Brad conquers Narsarswak. Welcome to Greenland. Here we are. 
They've now completed three legs of their mission. Only four more to go. Far from the land of icebergs and glaciers, Corey and Randy fly over the turquoise Caribbean on their way to Brazil with working landing gear that hasn't let them down so far. Yeah, there's a ton of people on that beach. They focus, but make it look good. Got a big audience down here in Hollywood. They're coming into St. Martin, dead tired and in desperate need of some shut-eye. Nice one. They might get some forced time off right now. Turns out their pint-sized bonanza is too small to rate immediate attention. The handler said that there's a bunch of big airlines that they have to fuel up first, um, some of those 757s and whatnot. It's a problem ferry pilots know all too well. They only need 300 liters of fuel, so they have to wait for the big planes that might be buying 200 times as much. They're going to get the big guys out of the way before they'll come fuel up a little guy. Corey isn't happy. But for once, he isn't worried about his delivery deadline. He even decides to take advantage of the delay for some fun. This, this airport's very well known uh, because everybody can stand right up on that fence, and there's a huge planes that come in to land right on top of them. So it's going to be fun to see. I've seen it on YouTube and the internet a bunch. I've never seen it in person. have had a few high-tension moments on this trip, but by now, they've put it all behind them. <laughs> and that's a good thing, because they're gonna need all the good vibes they can get for the next leg of this journey. In Greenland, Pete and Brad have just barnstormed their way through some serious turbulence. They're one third of the way to delivering the King Air to Quincy, Illinois. Ready? Yeah. While the plane is refueling, they check out the icebergs in the fjords near the airport. We're now taking a look at what's ahead of us. When we depart and head to Goose Bay, we'll be flying over a very extensive ice pack field full of icebergs. Holy smokers! Imagine having to land the airplane in that and not only survive the crash, but then you got all that to deal with. You, I mean, you're done. Yeah, look at the size of that. Being in Greenland reminds me a lot of Alaska, and I actually consider Alaska to be my home with the mountains and with the glaciers, the animals. I actually got really homesick. Brad was a medevac pilot in Alaska. Now he flies as a contract pilot in Afghanistan when he's not ferry flying. He spends about eight months a year in the air. Being a pilot is definitely difficult on home and family life. You're traveling all the time and uh, you lose a lot of friends and you miss a lot of good times with family. Let's roll. Uh, Canada, here we come. Brad and Pete are now on their last leg across the North Atlantic. They'll head to Quebec City and then onward to Illinois. You're writing notes and I'm cruising through a fjord. Yep. Are you kidding me? Is this boring? That's like, yeah, that's great. Look at the mountain. This is like an average day at work in, in Alaska, man. Uh, here we go to the Alaska River. It's okay. When, we, when do we stop to hear those? Do I go back in Iraq for on and on? But we're not flying in Iraq. Do I, we're, we're not, not in flying. Alaska right now. I know, now. but it looks exactly the same. 
by the animals. It's a neat place. It's special. It is special. You're special. <laughs> oh, for now, I'm on poses. <laughs> Forty nine hundred kilometers south. Corey and Randy are finally getting refueled. How are you doing? Can we get uh, both tanks topped off? Pull up. Yeah, thanks, buddy. And Corey's anxious to take off because they still have four thousand kilometers of flying ahead over the Caribbean Sea and across South America to deliver the client's plane within four days. Hey, Corey. Yo. Yeah, let's get the hell out you of here. Her. Yeah, let's get out of here. Corey's business has really taken off in the past two months. Bye-bye, St. Martin. We'll miss you. But the schedule's been a killer. We've got 310 nautical miles to go. I'm a little tired right now. We've had uh, three long days, and we're, having, we're constantly being challenged in one way or another. We're not eating much. I'm sure we're dehydrated because we're not drinking much. We put in a lot of hours in the cockpit every day. We don't get a lot of sleep. We're jumping time zones. Our body's always trying to catch up, but yet the type of flying we do requires the most concentration because something always goes wrong. I'm going to need your help on this flight. Always be double checking these gauges. Every minute, you should at least run your eyes past them, maybe even a little closer than normal. OK. This one engine, we have to take care of it, so it takes care of us. Extreme fatigue is dangerous enough when conditions are perfect. But suddenly, thunderheads come out of nowhere and close in on the tiny bonanza. Feel that? Yeah, this is crazy, dude. Boy, this is gonna get rough, man. Seriously, this could be really bad. Make sure you're strapped in. Up north in Quebec City, Pete and Brad are just landing. Like butter. Hey, how's it going? Good, you? Good. Welcome to Quebec City. Hey, thanks. Back in cell phone range, Brad makes a call. We're ferrying this plane from England, and it turns out we're landing in Quincy, Illinois. He hasn't seen his mother in over a year. This may be his big chance. And I looked at the map, it's like 300 miles away, and I was wondering if there's any chance you could get down there. I never get to see my mom. She's living in Chicago, and we were taking this plane to Quincy, Illinois. I think it's about 300 miles, and I'm just kind of wondering if there's any way I can see her. You know, I'm getting a free ride there, so. But a severe weather system moving across the Midwest might put these plans on hold. We're up here. We got to roll all the way down here through all of this crap, three lows. This could be a real problem. This type of weather can uh, be fatal. Yeah, this can take wings off. We need to get moving, like, ASAP. Vamanos. Europe. Right away, they see that this has the makings of a major storm system directly in their path. That's a massive cloud in front of us. Yes, it is. We will not be going through that. I am going to request a heading. Why don't you Remember, hey, Quebec, Romeo, I'll have on course for you in about seven or eight miles once I get you past three scattered areas of heavy precipitation. Yeah, we're just going to talk to you about that. We're looking at it. It's uh, quite significant. You can see all this red here. Obviously, red is not a good thing. It's painting the uh, heaviest precipitation, and uh, heavy precip comes out of thunderstorms. Air traffic control comes through, guiding them right around the thunderstorms to calm skies. There's the airport, I'm pretty sure. The airport's in sight. Now, they're closing in on the finish line. Quincy traffic to King Air, short final. This is uh, low approach only 3 1. Okay, dude, 140 knots. 200 feet. Roger. 
miles northwest, in man for left down wind, 3 1, Quincy. Guess what? We're in Quincy. There she is, taking photos. Brad rolls the King Air to a stop, and here's his welcoming committee. Hey, we made it. We finally made it. How's it going? It felt awesome to see my mom. I mean, I haven't seen her forever. Yeah. Hey, Mom, this is Pete. Hello. Hello. Nice my to meet partner you. in crime. <laughs> this is an absolutely gorgeous plane. It has to be fun to fly. We had fun. I think we made friends with it. Yep. Pete actually nicknamed it the Beast. The and beast. we had to tame the Beast. Are you going to miss her? I think I am going <laughs> to miss the Beast. Really? Yeah, it was a fun ride. It, it's always a fun ride, you know? And I'm going to okay. shed a tear tonight when I see her in the rearview mirror. I'll tell you, it's worth a 300 mile drive. Yeah, how about as infrequently as we get together. The King Air is finally home. After a tough 7,600 kilometer flight across one of the most challenging routes in the world. We're done here, then we're off to the next flight. What that is, we don't know yet. It could be South America, it could be Russia, it could be China. Each one has new challenges. That's part of the excitement. Over the Caribbean Sea, exhausted as they are, Corey and Randy have made it through a serious thunderstorm. The further we get away from this, the less problem it should be, so I'll be glad to get away from it. But now, a new problem. They're running out of daylight. That sun is setting fast. Randy switches from visual to instrument navigation. So Corey, we're going to shoot this approach, but we're not going to mess around. Roger that. Next stop, the Joshua Airport in St. Vincent. An airstrip so dangerous, three planes have crashed trying to land after dark. You have to have a special clearance to land at night, even if you're an instrument rated pilot. Corey and Randy don't have the clearance so they're racing to beat the clock. Thank you, sir. We're cleared down to 1,500 feet. Uh, 9 Whiskey Echo. But they might be too late. We would like to know whether you are checked out for night operations at the airport. OK, sir, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, this is our first time at that airport, but uh, we are IFR-rated pilots. Randy hopes that being qualified to fly by instrument will get him a pass to land. It doesn't work. Permission to land is denied, and it couldn't come at a worse time. Now, this simple flight is quickly turning into a nightmare. Next time on Dangerous Flights. Okay, we're tired. Don't do anything stupid. Fatigue takes a toll. Damn it. Randy puts his foot down. We pushed it too hard, too long. Let's start talking about uh, taking tomorrow off. This is cool. It's like space shuttle. And a flying computer. Stop. Stop. What the hell was that? Has a mind of its own. Slow, 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 slow. Join us, join us. It's like a caveman trying to figure out the, the kind of